All right, everybody, welcome to yet another episode of Break the Rules. We are sowing discourse today with the great and powerful Ed West. Ed, thank you so much for coming. It is a great pleasure to have you here. For those who don't know, Ed is the senior editor of Unheard and is the writer of a very interesting and very funny book called Small Men on the Wrong Side of History, which I am reading right now, and uh, I love it. It is absolutely tremendous read. It has that uh, kind of self-deprecating British uh, humor that I've, mm. always, uh, that I've always loved. And, of course, we have with us Gio Panicchietti, Alex Kashuta. And we're going to have a lot more people coming in soon. So everybody, don't forget to subscribe, sneed those super chats along, and uh, let's get right down into it. So, uh, Ed, can you tell us uh, why uh, you became conservative and how you define conservatism? Let's start with that. Uh, I, well, I mean, one of the things I explore in the book is, well, we all get it from our parents to a certain extent. So I, the book is a bit sort of autobiographical. And I, I talk about my dad, who was... Um, it was a kind of Cold War era, started off as a young communist and ended up as a very reactionary by the end. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I was influenced by my parents and I suppose maybe to some extent genetics as well. Um, but the main point of my book is if you're my age, I'm 43 and most of my sort of cohorts from my class, you know, people, uh, middle class English people growing up in, the, in London, go to university not only become liberal, but most of them have become more liberal as they get older. So they haven't um, gone through the sort of traditional pattern in the past. And I, the more I looked into it and the more it was the same, both uh, Britain and the States, that that generation after a certain year, like maybe 1975-ish in Britain, but definitely 1980, uh, they aren't becoming more, more conservative as they get older. There is kind of like hostility to conservatism. Um, so that was my basic thing, like that small men and wrong side history. That's actually Obama, Obama's phrase. I loved it so much. He was talking about Al Qaeda, actually. Obviously, I don't you know, consider um, a similar group, but um, well, so, so, some some would differ. Some would say they're pretty similar today, the way they were going. Right, the great Taliban here. Um, the conservatism, I suppose, it's it comes down to and I explore a little bit are the view of human nature, whether you have a a basically, I suppose, you know, the Augustine is, is the original conservative who has a kind of bleak, a bleak, a sort of, I would say, more realistic view of human nature, that humans are basically not perfect creatures and any political system has to take it into account that we are sort of, you know, fallible. We are more likely to not only be weak or greedy, but we're more likely to favor our own family over this, you know, idealistic human uh, race in the, in the general. So I, I don't know, I guess it comes down to a certain our view of human nature is the central point. And uh, Alex, oh, oh, go on, Gio. I wanted to well, ask Alex uh, some... after she agrees. <laughs> no, I was going to say some people, they, they track the lineage of the modern right to Joseph de Maistre after the French Revolution. But you're saying that it goes, this, these tendencies, they sort of go back farther. But also what I would say is that being from United Kingdom, how would your definition of conservatism differ that much from say an american or north american sort of like um liberal definition of conservatism and also we'll get to our great friend alex kashkuda so sure. i mean yeah in <laughs> politics in politics as we understand it starts with the french revolution because that's when the left right divide is actually termed and and anything before that gets slightly anachronistic but i do i sort of observe that there are sort of um in the theological debates you can see the the sort of precursors of um, this, uh, you know, wealthy about how how much humans can be sort of, you know, made perfect. I mean, Augustine is obviously the first because he is a very, I mean, he's quite a funny character. He's very, very pessimistic. He was kind of the, the cliche conservatives who, who's obsessed with sex and like thinks like he can't stop thinking about sex and therefore he has to like stop everyone thinking about sex. And uh. he just wants to get to an age where he doesn't think about sex all day and stop everyone else having sex. So, you know, classic conservative. But yeah, I mean, the mainstream is, I suppose, I would, he's more of a sort of reactionary, he's more of an ultra conservative. I mean, Burke is for the British, uh, he is the sort of founder. He's our, yeah, he's our demigod. So he's the founder of British conservatism. He articulated it in a way, and everything, at least on our side of the Atlantic, stems from him. I mean, obviously, 
a conservatism is different. I mean, the left and liberalism, particularly liberalism is universal. It basically applies to um, every country and it's kind of similar in every country where conservatism is much more uh, distinct by countries. So each one will have their own. So British and French conservatism are different to each other and they're different to Americans. Are. And the American style is much more Whiggish. They don't really have a, I mean, America, I mean, it's been said that it doesn't really have its own sort of native conservative tradition the same way in the sense that it didn't have a aristocracy or a monarchy or a church mm -hmm. to defend. Mm -hmm. And yeah. obviously America has a very rich conservative. It has lots of, I mean, it has most of the great conservative thinkers at the moment and um, it has its tradition, but you know, it's different. I mean, the English would consider the French conservative tradition quite wacky and quite extreme in many ways down the years. They've never had- Especially the, the contemporary one. The, yeah, the but I mean, French conservatism has always been like, quite, quite mm. hardcore. The, Eng the English are generally quite, you know, gentle about politics. They, um, well, they're not interested in politics most of the time. Um, but well, the, the French take these things very seriously and they can take things to, you know, make things very hard line. Yeah, very hard line going through one's, uh, one's neck when it comes yeah. to uh, what ended up going down. But uh, what's his name? James Fox. Do I get that right? He was uh, for whatever was going on with the French Revolution uh, at that time. And he was, was right. he English? Or he, yeah, he was English, right? Yeah, loads of, um, I mean, the, the funny thing is the English, I mean, this goes on now, is that the English, the Indian intelligentsia, if that's even the right word, in London, who are sort of very pro-EU now, and really, really dislike any sign of British or English flag waving. Um, and they're a complete anomaly in Europe. Like the sort of intelligentsia in most other Western European countries do not sort of dislike their country in the same way. Um, yeah. <laughs> and this goes back, this is a really, really old thing. Like the, the intelligentsia at the time of the revolution were very pro French revolution. I mean, we even sent a couple of people to the you know, National Assembly, there were like a couple of, I mean, as well as Thomas Paine went there and they almost yeah. killed him. I mean, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, that's right. Yeah. But, the, you know, loads of English intellectuals supported the French Revolution and then even supported it once Britain and France were at war. And eventually, begrudgingly, when Napoleon became a dictator and they realized, like, okay, we'll support. I mean, Wordsworth was just, you know, really, really, now I have to, you know, I can't remember exact words, obviously, better than mine, but. Said, you know, I suppose I have to support England in the war against Napoleon. Mm. But yeah, they, I mean, they, it's they kind always... of like the, the Stalinists and the Maoists in the 70s, right? They were like, oh man, what are we going to do? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Hmm. Um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, there's always been that, uh, that sort of tradition of. And, and uh, Alex, and Alex, uh, do you agree with uh, Ed's definition of conservatism? And also, just so you know, the reason why I'm muted is that there's a little bit of it's like somebody's in the background heavily breathing uh, in front of you whenever your audio is on. That's the only thing I noticed. But anyway, Alex, uh, go ahead. Let us know. Oh, you got to unmute yourself, though. There we go. OK, good. Sorry. I <laughs> I tend to breathe quite heavily because I'm um, yeah, I'm, I'm heavily pregnant. <laughs> I have this weird shallow breather. Yeah, do it. Sorry. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. This oh, is my oh, excuse for everything now. I was as creepy oh, by the way, as I get. One other, thing. <laughs> one other thing. I noticed your audio is loud as a rocket taking off. Is there any way that you can... Yeah, I'm manually making it lower right now, though, so you can talk. But after oh, uh, that, it's I'm... It's all right. It's all right. Yes, right. yes. Man, I've got, I've got the, the best equipment. <laughs> it's Perfect. just so much better than you, than you guys are, so that's why. Um, do I agree with that definition? Yeah, I think that's probably the the most concise definition, you know, the, the, the difference between kind of the utopian vision and the, the tragic vision and, you know, the conservatives embody the, the tragic vision. Um, and yeah, I think, um, to be honest, there's, there's everything kind of flows from there. There's, there's not that, that, that much distinction, but like, like Ed said, there are the different flavors of how people interpret this and in light of different traditions, you know, different ethnoses, um, and, and that's why you kind of have these, uh, these varieties of conservatism, um, all over Europe and all over North America. And there is, there is, I feel like a, a big distinction between European conservatism, uh, just because, um, our tradition, or I guess, you know, the British tradition, especially as has deep roots while, you know, uh, American conservatism was taken over by all sorts of forces that, you know, don't really, yeah, or don't really make any sense in, in the uh, in the Anglo tradition. You know, that's why essentially you have a libertarian conservative party in America and, you know, you don't really have the same in, in, in the in the UK or 
in on the continent so mm. but for yeah. romania specifically you guys had a uh, revolution ousting the uh, communist uh, dictator couple i saw an image recently actually a photograph of this young man with the gun it was just running uh you know, yeah that was, the 90s that was jacket. crazy the actual video of Chilchescu and his wife. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but anyway, I'm just curious. Do you think that there is still this, uh, in, uh, in your neck of the woods, this understanding of how dangerous something like communism is, or do you think that people have moved on and now new intellectuals are rising back up kind of saying like, Oh, maybe it wasn't that bad. Maybe we should like start reinstating certain policies of this sort. Yeah. It's, it's a tough one. There's still people who kind of, um, they're nostalgic, um, about the, the the former regime because they they had better positions you know everyone said it was a, a flat hierarchy but in, there was a very it was very hierarchical and some people were better placed than others people who now in you know the wild west of you know kind of this oligarchic capitalism that we have now are not doing as well as they used to uh, so they regret communism and then there are people who are maybe 20 something years old who really have no idea about communism you know they might have heard it from their crusty parents you know and <laughs> the people who they call boomers now. So they have absolutely no reference point. So if someone like AOC tells them that, you know, the Green New Deal or whatever sort of, you know, sweeping socialist reform is, is what we need globally, then they'll say, yeah, you know, she's she's pretty hot. So, yeah, I think that's probably what we need. So it's, this it's, Twitch streamer tells me that it's cool. Mm. It's cool. It's, yeah. And uh, yeah. Ed, is, is it the same way uh, in England right now from a lot of the young people who uh, you're uh, speaking with and... Uh... What, what do you but notice also in the air right now? But also, it's interesting what, what you said, Ed, and, and both you and Alex can talk about this, how you're saying the intelligentsia in Britain as it is now. I do notice this as well. They are very, like, anti their own country the way that I would even say um, American intellectuals are against America. And I wonder if that's sort of like a like a reverse sort of import from America to Britain more than any other European country, especially among the quote unquote middle class, or here we call it upper middle class in North America. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, I mean, we, we are, so, we have the sort of least immunity to, you know, American political culture and like the worst aspects of American political culture. I mean, last year we saw our intelligentsia, to use the word against, um, <laughs> kind of blindly copied the American kind of political madness um, I think in that the kind of self hatred is probably one of the, the most sort of indigenous things. Anyway, we didn't really need to import that. I mean, I, I, I wonder if it's probably more so in in Britain. Even it's such a sort of a long established thing that um, you know our intellectuals and they're the same. And our intellectuals were growing up. They you know lots of them sided with uh, the Soviets right until way after it was decent. Way after you know long after. You know, things like Eric Hosborn, who was, you know, supported to Stalin after Hungary, after Czechoslovakia, after <laughs> communism fell down. He was still, and, you know, he, he gets, you know, he gets all sorts of honours from the British establishment. Um, there's no sort of, uh, there's no social stigma about supporting our enemies or this. I mean, I, I think it is partly it comes down to, you know, we are, we are very comfortable in Britain. We are, we have an, we we have a sea around us, very hard to invade. We haven't suffered like Central Europe has suffered. So it, it, we wouldn't have the arrogance if you had lived under 40 years of Russian control to say, you know, actually communism is a great idea. Um, and it comes from it comes from a position of sort of, I suppose, power. And I think it's the same, the British and American elites in the same way. It's a kind of narcissism when you have that much comfort and wealth. Yeah. You know, it's very easy to adopt these kind of meaningless positions. And I must uh, say that in, um, in unheard, you people publish some of the you finest, people. What do you mean by you uh, people? You people, um, <laughs> some of the the finest intellectuals that are um, sort of breaking the mold. Um, I even have a few people, um, a few friends of ours that publish there: Mary Harrington, Ben right, Sixsmith, yeah. um, uh, John Gray, even is another dissident sort of thinker. Um, so I think that's it becomes there's space now for that. But another question was interesting. I, I think maybe you touched upon this in your book. Do you think that in specifically in Britain, that the colonialism, the colonial experience in the post-colonial movements, do you think that has sort of shaped conservatism in a fundamental way, as opposed to like, for example, in America, 
who is, you could argue, sort of going through an empire moment. Do you right. think that sort of the fall of British colonialism, you know, the, the sun never sets on the British empire. Do you think that's sort of been a sort of crushing blow to conservatism in Britain? Or do you think that maybe somehow, I don't know, maybe Margaret Thatcher sort of revived the movement in the 80s? Who knows, right? Um, I, don't, I mean, the thing about the empire is the empire is getting discussed now. But again, it's a sort of... Uh, it's sort of like a meme copied from American politics. I mean, the British Empire, if you look at people's, what people talked about in Britain, almost no one ever talked about it. I mean, it wasn't really an issue. Most people didn't really care, unless you were involved in the British Empire, uh, unless you had family members in it. And the British Empire was run by a very small number of people. Um, most people never really talked about it. It's become a sort of issue now, um, sort of as a sort of, partly as a kind of multiculturalism thing, because lots of people come from different parts um, are descended from migrants from the empire, but it's also, I mean, it, the kind of slavery thing, which has now become another big issue, is purely like an American meme that's just been. I mean, British people are so obsessed with American culture now that you no, know, there was an issue. There was a statement by um by a bookseller. It's called the Bookseller, which uh, is a sort of magazine of the trade publishing industry, denouncing. Uh, it was, I mean, the actual background was, was ridiculous. It was saying transphobia was an, an akin to Nazi Germany, which shows how brilliant our <laughs> education system is. And then they said, we'll see a return to segregated bathrooms. And they actually said that. And I remember thinking, this is, it, this is issued by a British company about British publishing. It's like, we've never had segregated bathrooms in Britain. It's like, we had like a tiny non-white population until 70 years ago. They completely memed into existence American history over their own almost they don't even know their own history mm. and, and if um, i understand correctly uh britain ended up uh freeing uh the slaves that were around like in the uh 1800s i believe or when exactly did that happen was britain one of right. the first countries well, to do britain, it in general britain abolished slavery in 1772 in england in england mm. so the court ruled that there was no slavery in england because i mean slavery was abolished by the normans so uh there was a case where there was a black guy who was run away and they came to the court and the court said, there's no slavery in England, so you're, you're free. Any, but the, I mean, the, but then Britain, the slave trade was abolished in 1807 and then the slavery everywhere in the empire was 1837. I mean, the thing about the British empire was the early British empire was an extremely brutal, horrific thing. And the, the Atlantic slave trade was unbelievably awful. Uh, and for people like the Australians, Aborigines in Tasmania, it meant complete genocide. The later British empire was generally quite benevolent humanitarian and did lots of good things so you know it went through like it's a vastly complicated subject you can talk about from two if you, you know if you came from malta the british empire was was very uh, very much a good thing if you lived in hong kong it was very much a good thing if you live in ireland it was pretty bad overall oh yeah um so you know you can have vastly different experiences so of course you know slavery is a is an awful was an awful sand chance of slavery there's no doubt about it was you know something off the scale compared to anything previous but 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 who wasn't engaged in uh, this kind of behavior during those times it almost seems like back then yeah, nobody's innocent everybody's going to be doing a lot of this stuff um, yeah i mean slavery has been the, the norm in all history i mean the british forced the ottoman empire for example to abolish slavery i mean when when the beatles uh the same year i think it was like the revolver revolver came out maybe rubber cell there's 1965 1966 the British were still freeing about 20 slaves a year in the in in Oman um, and Saudi Arabia and other parts of the Middle East, where you would if you got to the British consulate in those countries, you were they would free you and you'd get a little yeah. poster saying with the Union Jack. I mean, so why don't people they, celebrate they, that? That's great. Shouldn't they be like celebrating Britain for free? You know, that it's good stuff. Brit you know, to be high, to be a status, to high, get high status in Britain, you have to be anti-British. It's been like that for ages. Yeah. It makes you really smart and you went to university, etc. Uh... It feels like um, a, a lot of it is is the curse of having documented all of almost all of, you know, the, 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 the nature of the empire, you know, a lot of very literate people, a lot of very, very high skilled literate people documenting their lives, other people's lives, the atrocities, the, the, the phenomenon of empire in general, uh, like, you know, Romania was part of the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you know, empire over empires was fighting over this land. But the documentation and even even just the, the 
the quality of literature produced about this empire is is minimal. So and also, you know, you don't really have the the, the cultural cachet to, to to disseminate it like uh, like the Anglo civilization has. So in a way, you're kind of um, a victim of your own uh, literacy and success and and, and also, specialization. Like Anglo managerialism, the birthplace of it was in the British Isles. So mm. that's another. But but also as far as uh, integrating uh, people from uh, let's say uh, different cultures into Britain from what I understand and I've never lived in England but from what I get people who were originally part of the British Raj in India they were able to integrate uh, pretty well into English society but there are still uh, situations when you get people who are migrants who come into uh, Britain who are, let's say from what I heard a lot of Pakistan uh, uh, born uh, migrants who come in there is a cultural clash that ends up happening not like with the people in India what would you mainly attribute like these uh, differences to and is there a way that we can like i always say like my policy is i don't care where you're from as long i have an open door for anyone as long as you can meet a certain standard so that there will be uh you know peace and harmony within wherever you happen to be with everybody else you know and it doesn't matter what you look like or where you're from as long as that could be uh, met i mean i suppose that the obvious answer is religion but it's probably more to do with class i mean the migrants came from india tended to be um urban the kind of urban mercantile you know, generations and generations of shopkeepers. Um, and that applies to the Hindus and, and Indian Muslims as well. I mean, like Sam Rushdie came from an Indian Muslim background. Um, so they tend to, have, you know, there's like Gujaratis, they've been trading since, you know, our ancestors are worshiping stones and stuff. So, you know, those, they make for, a, they're very well off. They tend to be concentrated, um, like Sikhs and Hindu in Britain are very concentrated in the Thames Valley, which is the richest part of the country. So very, you know, nice stretch from London going west. Um, and so, you know, our Home Secretary is from a Gujarati background. Our Chancellor is from an Indian background. Um, I mean, the Pakistani, most Pakistani migrants and the same as Bangladeshis came from like very clannish hill areas uh, where cousin marriage is still normal. I mean, in Bradford, I think it's, you know, 60% of marriages in the Pakistani community are still cousin marriage, uh, which is on top of the health issue also. It doesn't, you know, if it doesn't help integration if you can't even integrate. I mean, because marrying into another family is in a form of integration on a sort of micro level, as you know, as everyone knows, it's hard. You have to you're dealing with a different culture of someone else's family, but sort of groups that tend to marry within their own clan are obviously are quite hard to integrate into into the wider public. I mean, it also doesn't help is that these are kind of very so quite very conservative cultures and England is in a way like one of the most decadent countries in the world and not just sexually decadent, but also kind of morally decadent, I think. Um, and there is a huge clash of cultures. Um, I mean, you know, the worst example is obviously the big grooming gang thing, which is sort of yeah. swept under the carpet in England, which is, I mean, worse than anything really that happened in Victorian times, which is, it's so astonishing that it actually happened that, um, and I think it's probably still going on as well now. Um, but I mean, it's been a, a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, France has got a worse problem. So we, you know, we have to at least thank ourselves that it's not so bad yeah. there. Well, I what mean, is happening in France right now? I heard things about generals that are uh, writing letters about uh, wanting to know. change things. What exactly is going on? I don't know if that's just the French, because a lot of this like performative, you know, there was an opinion poll, wasn't there? They're saying that like, Half of French people agreed with the generals and would support a coup if that happened. Um, but I think a lot of this, it's like when the French, they all, they all claim to believe in every conspiracy going. A lot of it's just sort of, they like to answer silly questions, the polls a little bit. I don't think they, you know, they all said they would refuse to take the vaccine, but they, they all they seem to be doing it now. I don't know whether for half French people would actually support a military coup. It sounds a bit like unlikely. But they, I mean, they have had a bit of a, you know, it's a serious problem if you go to France, uh, you know, you go around the small little wine tasting place in the in Provence, you'll see like five, you know, soldiers with machine guns walking around. There's a serious problem with political violence there. But then, I mean, it always has been a bit more of a violent society in England in that sense. It's got far more guns, um, you know, and, and as, far as even in the 1960s, there was lots of political violence going on in the country. You know, yeah, there's all the yeah. I mean, there's, And uh, you, uh, were, you were mentioning in your book that when you grew up, 
before you went to school there was less violence and then there were more then there was more violence afterwards uh in the uh, early 90s i believe and uh, what what would you attribute that rise of violence to uh, we also have kathy young over here so i want to get to afterwards hello. as well hello okay. kathy how are you hi can you see me not yet so please turn oh. your camera on and then ah, we shall see yes, you I see. okay yeah okay got it okay I think there we now, go. Yeah, now there you can go. see. Hey, how are you? Yeah, I'm on a new computer, and I completely forgot that I hadn't installed Zoom on this computer yet, so that kind of slowed me down a bit. No problem at all. Oh, and by the way, okay. uh, are you Russian? Yes. Yes, very nice to meet you. I don't want to turn this into a Russian conversation-only stream. I just wanted to get that out there. But anyway... Uh, oh, and, my goodness. Yes. But <laughs> I, I was not born. I'm originally from St. Petersburg, Russia. So uh, oh, that's, that's called why. called Leningrad, love. It's yeah, called it was, Lenin. oh, Never mind. Okay. Anyway. Ah, I so, spent, uh, when I was a child in, in the Soviet Union, my grandmother and I would always go like on the New Year kind of Christmas Eve vacation, we would always go to Leningrad because that's where her family was. And uh, so, yeah, like a, a very kind of emotionally impactful part of my childhood was spent in uh, St. Petersburg. For, for me, a very emotional part of my childhood was spent not exactly in St. Petersburg, but in Estonia, right next door in this uh -huh. area that's right to the border because their food was much better. They had beautiful forests there. And just in general, like the spirit of okay. Estonia, I like better because right now, now they're kicking the butt out of Russia and all oh, these yeah, other yeah, countries yeah. and what they're doing. And I want to get that a little bit later as far as a happy all reunion right. with Estonia. Okay. But Ed, can you talk a little yeah. bit about why yeah. the rise in violence in the uh, 90s? And where exactly do you see the violence level in uh, England today? Oh, well, well, I kind of mentioned, well, I suppose one of your views as a conservative liberal is how you view like crime and how uh, how much you, you fear crime. Um I mean, England, England's crime levels went up a lot from the 60s to the 90s. It's pretty much the same as the US, but on a much lower, much less extreme uh, level. But, you know, our murder rate is obviously going to be like lower. So, I mean, the 90s was probably was the peak of violent crime in Britain. But then now everyone's, we, we have so much CCTV in Britain. Like, if I walk outside now, there'll be 184 cameras staring at me. So that kind of basically... Yeah. It. And, you know, it's kind of people say oh, at first it was always oh, very Orwellian and, you know, the, the English love freedom. We'll never put up with it. But everyone loves it. You know, everyone loves being spied on constantly by everyone. You know, we're a nation of spies. Um, so that <laughs> basically put our crime rate down to a, you know, it's still quite, you know, I mean, London is. It's still quite I mean, there is still a bit of violence and a bit of crime and it's gone up a bit uh, across the country. But again, I mean, in American terms, it's really. Uh, Still quite. I think we overtook New York's murder rate for one month. That was not bad. That was, That's a well, big accomplishment. It's, co actually. it's coming back now. There was unfortunately <laughs> yeah, a murder yeah, in. Uh... Us again. Yeah, so, but I mean, yeah. you know, the extremes in in the states are so much higher that you know, it doesn't. I mean, what England has is much things like pub fighting. That's the sort of violence you will yeah. see much in the states. And the uh, uh, license. Do you have a license for that butter yeah, knife? Yeah. <laughs> we have a thing where the. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you watch the uh, the different London boroughs and their their police teams, and they say you know those pictures. Uh, we've, uh, we've yeah, the me there's been memes of that. The picture of yeah. like, the butter knife, yeah. And it's literally it's like a spoon or something. I said, like, <laughs> wow, thanks guys. The streets are safe once again. Yeah, so and I mean, no, there are parts of London which are quite dangerous, but um, I mean, Britain has Britain's NHS, bless them. We have the most advanced um, surgical techniques for dealing with um, knife wounds. We've become so good in the last 20 years because we have quite a lot of problems with knife crime. But, you well, know, again, it, there's only so much people can do with knives. We, I mean, the guns are very, very hard to get hold of in England, even for criminals. So, yeah. Uh, but as far as other, other things like uh, vehicles, trucks, things of that nature, like if people want to be creative, they would figure out certain ways, unfortunately, to, uh, you know, create chaos and harm where they wouldn't even need uh, guns necessarily to do that. Yeah, we've and got bollards now everywhere as well, literally. I mean, yeah. there's nothing in England. It's basically like it's like a padded cell. There's wow. um, and everyone has it. Um, no, See, no. Just... Every every bridge in London has bollards all over it because that's happened so many times now. People ramming. Well, see, up. like when I when I see something like that, it reminds me of what Adam Carolla said about how you can judge a city or uh, let's say a small town or whatever based on when you go into the market, uh, go into the CVS pharmacy, 
are certain areas, let's say, filled with uh, this uh, glass that you need somebody to walk in and uh, turn the key in order for you to access certain products. Or same thing with a uh, Coca-Cola um, you know, machine. Like, is the Coca-Cola machine inside of some kind of a cage device or is it, like, out there free? You know, that says something about one society and my goal is to, ha you know, have more societies not have those things on them. I'm from the south of England. When I first went to the north, as a teenager at university, when you go to the off license to buy a drink, everything's behind glass. And I saw this everywhere and I thought, what? Um, but that, that, I mean, that's not every part of the North, but that, that, that was in Manchester. Yes, yeah, so that's a similar sort of thing to stop people um, getting the hell into it. Yeah, I mean, England's a bit like that. Most things are behind various things to stop people getting this stuff. Well, I do but, want to um, get to how, to how to fix that, but I want to do a quick introduction. We also have Jessica Deloach oh, yeah, okay. joining us once again. She was the uh, former um, uh, political strategist for uh, Pete uh, Buttigieg's campaign, and she is part of the uh, New Deal leaders. And uh, I'm not actually sure, what are the New Deal leaders? So, uh, yeah. Jessica, could you talk a little bit about that? And I also want to say we also have Kathy Young here, who I did not do the introduction for, and I'm going to do right now. So, Kathy has written for Arc Digital, for Reason Magazine, Magazine, for Newsday, for Bulwark Online, for The Week, etc., etc., etc. So, welcome to uh, both uh, both of you. And uh, Jessica, oh. could you could you say a little bit about uh, what exactly the uh, this uh, new deal New Deal uh, leaders is? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Sorry, I was a little late today. It's been a busy day. So, um, when I went to work for the New Deal, I was uh, working as their political director. And so the New Deal is a network of state and local level elected officials all throughout the United States that um, operate on the left. So they are, they tend to be not too far to the left. Um, they don't really get too uh, worked up over social issues. They're mostly focused on, you know, just how you make this country work. They are very mild mannered, brilliant, wonderful leaders. It's actually um, been really incredible to be a part of this group because we've had several different elected officials who have gone on to run for different offices on higher levels. And they've really been, uh, they've been great ambassadors to what I would say is kind of like the, the bench of the, the Democratic Party's future uh, here in the U.S. So it's been really wonderful getting to know these people and watching them move through their leadership capacities. But uh, yeah, so I um, after the New Deal was when I went on to the campaign for Pete. And now I spend my time working in uh, communications, political communications and strategy. So it's really great to be back with you guys today. Um, I always love these conversations. So thanks so much for having me on. I always love you being here. So <laughs> now is, I think, a good opportunity to also... Oh, and also, uh, Kathy, can you also tell us a little bit more about yourself before we uh, commence as well? It's actually oh, surreal. Oh, my goodness. Well, all right. Uh, so I was uh, born in Russia back when it was still the Soviet Union uh, in uh, 1963. Um, and I came to the United States in 1980 uh, as a teenager. Uh, and, uh, you know, about 10 years later, well, 11 years later, the Soviet Union ceased to exist, much to my surprise. <laughs> so, you know, it's, much to a uh, lot of people's apparently. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, um, uh, yeah, I actually, um, around that time, I traveled to Russia quite a bit. I was already working as a journalist, and I think I made a total of five trips there. Um, between 1990 and uh, 1993. And it's like, I really wanted to go again. And it's like, every time I start making plans, another journalist gets murdered over there. So that I'm like, you know, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, and Ed, Ed, there's uh, plenty I mean, of, maybe uh... I'll go somewhere safe, like Iraq, you know, <laughs> Anyway. Well, there, there are plenty uh, of, uh, I think, uh, very rich Russian people that are uh, doing a lot of good for the economy of uh, London specifically. Uh, oh, Ed, yes. If I'm not, so if I've I'm not mistaken, Ed, there's plenty so of... So uh... I've heard. And uh, when it comes to 
just these definitions that we use today, conservative, liberal, left and right. I would love to open this to everybody, but start specifically with yourself, Ed. Do you think these are good definitions anymore when it comes to, let's say, I think today there may be certain people that would, let's say, be within uh, the Democratic Party along with Jess, let's say, but have very different uh, views than what some people would consider to be, uh, you know, their definition of liberal or their definition of uh, Democrat. Would you think that today maybe because there's more access to information and uh, there's more of an opportunity to, let's say, be a little bit more selective about the viewpoint that you have, that there are people coming out there who have, let's say, more nuanced ways of taking certain things from one and the other? And would you say that it warrants a different definition for those particular people? I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously liberal has, you know, two different meanings, I suppose. Yeah, there's the sort of more traditional, um, you know, classical liberal and, and there's left liberal, which is a, which which is kind of how it's generally used in the discourse, usually in an insulting way. I mean, there is definitely a, there is a sort of, it seems definitely coming from the States, a sort of new ideolo ideology, which is a bit, not really, it's just so disconnected from liberalism anymore. Uh, I mean, I hate the word woke, but you know, people always use it because it's a shorthand for something you can understand. I base, I suppose you could basically say it's a belief in equality of outcomes between groups, um, even state enforced, um, a sort of denial of any biological differences, even between men and women. And, you know, there's sort of a selection of beliefs, which I suppose I, I say progressive because that's a sort of like morally neutral way. And I, I think you should call people what they would, you know, happily call themselves. Um, and I think that kind of progressivism does seem to have a slightly, like a sort of totalitarian edge to, I mean, you understand hysterical, but it's not, I mean, it's not like the Soviet Union, um, but it has a, there's certain beliefs in, you know, um, in accepting other people's free speech in accepting other people's right to speak in certain situations in, in hostility to political violence, which are all in decline, I lost quite a lot um, in the state, certainly, if opinion polls are to go with. Um, so, you know, there is kind of li liberalism has kind of died on that edge. Well, I suppose where we are and unheard a lot of the stuff is pe we, we spent like a whole weekend debate, you know, having a conference debating this word and we couldn't even decide what it meant in the end, um, which is post-liberalism, which means a sort of variety of things. Normally, often people who are kind of like, kind of economically a bit on the left and socially a bit on the right, but it, it's, it's more the people who just think that there are kind of excesses to liberalism. My, my, my main problem with liberalism, um, which I don't think is a bad idea, it's just this kind of, it's like it has a, like a runaway momentum of itself. Like it never stops. It has to keep on going. It keep, has to keep on um, coming up with the next idea. So it, it kind of by its nature comes to takes on quite extreme positions. Um, so that, and again, but then that's nothing new. The conservatives are basically trying to put the brakes on everything, aren't they? That's, that's always been our job. But it's, so yeah, I mean, yeah, sorry, continue. No, no, I was going to say this is crazy um, how these definitions have changed, especially within like, I would even say the last 10 years, like within the 2010s. Um, I know Kathy Young, uh, you are um, famous for the ground zero of the internet, which is kind of surreal, me being in a live stream with you, because I remember those uh, Gamergate days and how oh, fun yeah. fundamentally they changed political discourse. And and I know, Alex, uh, you your ears perked up a bit because me and you, we also talk about where I guess you could say in this like framework of post-liberalism. And it's funny how even just the direct causes of like what we are experiencing now in this present moment. I'm curious to know both of your thoughts and, and cause this panel where it seemed to be like all across the spectrum. That's what we do uh, here at yeah. BTR. We bring people together like this, but yeah. just like where, like what causes our contemporary political discourse and our contemporary political divide, whether it was liberalism or not, or whether it was some other sort of alien force. I mean, that's always going to be the, the question, right? Well, if I can chime in here, yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. So I, I, I guess I'll be the resident liberal, but you know that's uh, like liberal. Uh, I mean, I, I guess we're at a moment where labels are becoming really inadequate, and I think that like even a lot of the traditional concepts of left and right 
um, are uh, really kind of in flux. Um, like liberal uh, is what is is everything that's happening right now under the kind of general label of wokeness. Is that liberalism? I mean, I wouldn't say that because a lot of like, if you look at, and I know that critical race theory has become this horrible buzzword that is being just randomly thrown about, you know, and it's, you know, everyone is kind of getting sick of it. But I mean, there really is such a thing as critical race theory. And, um, you know, it, it, it does kind of underlie a lot of the ideology, I would say, that is behind you know, what we identify as wokeness, um, even though it obviously extends to other areas beyond race, but the, this whole ideology that views society as a kind of matrix of uh, interlocking oppressions, essentially, and systems of oppression. Um, that ideology actually very specifically and very overtly positions itself as being in opposition to liberalism. I mean, if you look at the foundational texts for like critical race theory, they, they very specifically say that like, our whole thing is rejecting liberalism because clearly liberalism has been inadequate in accomplishing equality for, um, you know, for, 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 for minorities. And the same thing with feminism, where you see a lot of, I mean, liberal feminism is kind of a pejorative in, in um, uh, these kind of radical progressive feminists. Yeah, like remember when we had Nina Paley on, Geo? Like she definitely spoke to that. I don't know, Kathy, do you oh, know yeah. Nina Paley by any chance? Uh, the name rings a bell. Who is she? She's a great animator who did Cedar Sings the Blues, oh, okay. Seder, Masochism, and uh, you could say oh, like okay. she's a self-described rat femme or a turf, oh, as she is called. <laughs> yes. Oh, I see. Okay. That's, yeah, well, that's a whole other... Like, yes, yes, exactly. Uh, you know, but uh, but uh, Jessica, but, would yeah, you... Yeah, so oh, I think oh, yes. liberalism is really like among the... Uh, among a lot of the... Um, you know, the, the, among much of the current left, I would say liberalism is kind of a dirty word. So I'm not even sure we're talking about the same thing when we're talking about liberalism. So, I mean, are we seeing this sort of natural evolution of liberalism? I mean, I would agree. And I think this is part of what Ed is driving at. I think it's very difficult for liberalism to kind of push back against any claims uh, based on uh, ostensible demands for equality, you know, and it, even if those claims are actually not about equality, uh, they're very much about sort of special treatment, and they're very much about actually, you know, differential treatment based on identity. But as long as this is dressed up in the language of equality, I think a lot of liberals uh, really do have a very hard time resisting that. But and I know that's something that's endemic to liberalism because liberalism is so kind of reflexively pro-equality because equality was, of course, one of the three kind of great, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité, you know, that was like one of the three pillars. And, uh, you know, that way, and of course, all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence. So that's like equality, it, is, it really is one of the foundational um, liberal ideas. And of course, that was meant to be in a very different sense of uh, the, basically the equal human worth of, you know, all people and uh, the uh, kind of this, uh, certain fundamental rights that are equally enjoyed by all. And of course, the problem is also that we now know that you know, uh, the, the, the principle of equality was severely compromised at the foundation of the United States, for instance, because, you know, we legalized, we, we allowed slavery to, to legally continue. So I think there is also a great deal of... Yeah, kind late, of later than the uh, British that, did. We yeah. Think, yeah. You know, it's funny, though. I, I mean, um, Ed's book, a, a good title could have also been um, Small Men at the End of History, so that's sort of like the the position of being a conservative and like this 
what people would call a liberal epoch. But I wanted to get to Jessica, but also uh, Alex, Alex you, you're uh, you're just burning to uh, address Kathy Young's liberalism. And someone in the <laughs> chat said, um, where, when is James Lindsay? James Lindsay is afraid <laughs> to debate me and Alex, okay? He is afraid. So if someone could coax him on to break the rules, that would be uh, excellent. Uh, I've been trying my effort. best. I'm already out of energy, so uh, I ask everybody yeah. watching this to do so. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, yes. Debate me, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Debate me, bro. Um, yeah. I I think you know, like Kathy said, you know, the the definitions of of these terms are starting to fray a little bit, and I think that's 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 also a good thing, because I think you know people have been a, a bit stuck in these in these terminologies, especially just looking at how different they are. You know, even transatlantically, like a, a liberal in the UK is definitely not the same as a liberal in in the US. But I do think they they describe. Um, a certain tendency, a certain um, idea, and, and in a way, what this this whole thing about you know post liberalism, meta liberalism, after liberalism is talking about, is the fact that we are kind of all swimming in the liberal soup. And on on the right side, you kind of have right liberalism, which is you know kind of very concerned with free market ideals. You know, you want to you want to um, free the entrepreneurial spirit of man. You don't want to impinge on that. Uh, and on the progressive liberalism, like left liberalism side, you you kind of have this freedom from the body in a way. It's almost like a it's it's quite profoundly religious. It's like triumph it's kind of nature. like yeah, and it's Gnosticism of yes, of it's, it's political Gnosticism. Yeah, yeah. yeah, where you okay, you you decide you are you're the self making self. You're a rational individual, so you can make all of these choices and customize your life like it's a video game skin. So that's kind of the end point of of progressivism. Um, and I feel like you know they they kind of have the same source, but they are manifesting in different ways. So I think, you know, if, if this is what you mean by liberalism, and I feel like a lot of, you know, like John Stuart Mill, he kind of, this is what he meant by liberalism, if you, if you look at his writing, then yes, this is in many ways an endpoint of this type of thinking. Um, sorry, I'm so out of breath. Yeah. Well, um, that, that's a good question, like whether liberalism leads to a lot of this leftism. I disagree, but I would love to get Jessica's uh, opinion on what was said so far uh, with Kathy and Ed and uh, yourself, Alexandra, when it comes to this differentiation. You could say like a schism between what would be considered one kind of liberalism and another kind of liberalism. Uh, Jessica, I'm curious uh, what you think on that matter. Yeah. So we've talked about quite a lot since I've hopped on or hopped into this conversation. And, you know, I, I think what I could do uh, to, I think, add some dimension to this conversation or further dimension would be to say, you know, if you're living in the United States, you know, I would argue that a lot of people here don't take the time to ask, you know, what is liberalism and, and how is it reflected across the the world. You know, in the United States, everything is incredibly politically polarized. And so when you're talking about the left and the right, you know, oftentimes people don't even bother making the distinction between, you know, if you're more of a moderate Democrat or conservative. Um, there's just so much talk of the far left and the radical right. And the reality is, is that a lot of American voters exist pretty well in the middle. Um, now, that said, what you see portrayed by our media is not that. And it's really unfortunate, but that's truly a product of, of our media being, um, you know, it's 24 hours a day. It's a constant stream of news, people making up news, uh, reporters not doing their homework. There's, you know, and I'm not saying this to um, denigrate the, the media overall in the United States, because I'm very proud of the freedom that we do have. But there is the reality that there are a handful of people who own these large entities and they have pretty significant say in the news that is uh, generated. And then you also have um, on a local level, you know, there's an entity called Sinclair Broadcasting and they have just cookie cutter news programs that they feed into households all across the country and it leans to the right. Um, you know, when we are, <laughs> it's really unfortunate because when people are talking about Congress, you'll hear a lot of conversations about the, you know, more firebrand politicians, the more outspoken individuals, and they truly do not represent the United States as a whole. They don't even come close to it, but they, they get the most attention because they are either at each other's necks or they, um, 
they know how to make their own sound bites to get attention. And then what ends up happening is that our media replays it and then they're able to center their fundraising around it. It's, it's all pretty gross. Um, you know, I, I tend to think that anyone's political philosophy, I, I think it's, you know, great for you to know where you stand, but very, very important for you to have the capacity to listen to other people and try to understand where they're coming from. It's very easy to vilify people based on their political beliefs. Um, there will always be an ongoing conversation about the end of liberalism or, you know, is it even possible that it could transition into anything else? And, you know, I don't, I don't think that it's necessarily an end, but I do think that this country is at a bit of a turning point. I just don't know which way it's going to go because we have so many elected officials who create issues out of, well, they create problems out of issues that really aren't present. So right now what we've been, um, I know someone brought up critical race theory. So in this country, we've had a lot of individuals on the right bring up critical race theory and they're kind of treating it as a wedge issue. It's actually really not been that great of an issue in the way that they've been portraying it. So for instance, we have um, a United States Senator named Tom Cotton. He has been wanting to go after universities and other, um, you know, just basically any educational entity that uh, engages in critical race theory. So what he's wanting to do now is to go after Ivy League schools that um, promote that or teach that on their campuses. And he's looking to go after their endowments, I believe. And it's basically a punitive measure to say, if you're going to do this, then this is going to be the cost. Um, now, unfortunately, the reason why critical race theory is being talked about is because the United States is being forced to face its issues with race. And because of that, we've had a lot of people doing their own research, a lot of activists who have been promoting uh, lots of different ways of thinking about how you can approach race, how you can create a more equitable society. And oftentimes that conversation is devoid of what people um, are taught to believe versus what they may inherently believe, which there's a lot of debate around around all of that, whether racism is taught or if it's, if it's inside of a person. And um, critical race theory now, what you're hearing is a lot of white, usually conservative male politicians, and also now a lot more women, um, saying that it's precisely because of critical race theory that young people are going to be taught that they are bad for the color of their skin, meaning you're bad because you're white. And that that is not fair. That's basically what they're getting at. And so, you know, we now, um, of course, just like like with any issue, you're going to have the uh, pendulum swing back in the other direction. We now have a woman who lives in Illinois, maybe outside of Chicago. I can't quite remember, but she's running for school board. She's um, a black woman with children and she is on the left. She, too, is against critical race theory because she believes that by going down that road and engaging in, in that learning that it makes victims of her children. So you see, anytime you have an issue emerge in this country, it is not uncommon to have people on the opposite end of the spectrum find their own issue with these issues that were non-issues. And then you have this whole conversation building up around it. And the conversations really don't go anywhere, but they do become wedge issues. And I, I think I've probably done a bit of a poor job explaining this, but I, I am trying, even though I am a Democrat and I have been working in Democratic Party politics um, for most of my professional life, I am trying my best to separate out my political views from the way that I interact with the world because one person cannot possibly have it all right. But I will tell you that it is very challenging to be understanding of people who in this country, um, you know, were very quick to say, I'm okay with storming your nation's capital. I feel oppressed, even though they're not really oppressed. I mean, the most honest thing that any American can say to anyone right now is that the biggest issue in this nation is the wealth gap. That's the biggest challenge. Well, because, I wanted to get to that, Jessica. Yeah. I wanted to get back to, to Ed uh, to ask him about, because the Unheard had this big series about Boris Johnson and people are absolutely vilifying the conservative party in the chat. Um, uh, but I wanted to ask you in particular, and I wanted to also get Kathy Young involved. Um, 
what to the criticisms now what you said um is of course debatable um from my perspective mm -hmm. but what about the criticisms that the democrat party um now that biden has been elected it, a lot of people view it as like the triumph of neo of neoliberalism and the sort of like impersonal managerial state in america has come again like the sort of late late obama era of political placidity in that regard what would you say to the criticisms that the Democrat Party has sort of abandoned a lot of their older, more economically left mandates, uh, unionism, for instance, uh, class issues, and now that we're getting this sort of like ignorance of class, but now we have like AOC identity politics, um, and that's here to stay, and the Democrats don't really have a plan forward in terms of the quote unquote global left when it comes to economics in particular and that's sort of the class issues of like those sort of like socialistic uh, sort of linchpins that they're gone and now it's all just quote unquote wokeness like what would you say to that and also kathy young you are also deeply involved in this from the other side you know in american yeah. politics so um I, okay oh, oh no, no no you go ahead sorry okay well i'll, I'll try to make it quick um so I, I would like to caution against, and I'm not saying this about you, Gio, I'm, I'm saying overall, it's very important not to be um, reductionist about some of this. So I would say identity politics is pretty prevalent on both sides of the aisle here in the United States. It's just whether or not you're willing to, um, to see that because there is victimhood wrapped in identity politics and it's weaponized. Um, I think that the United States, because it is currently grappling with issues of populism and whether or not we, you know, we, we are a nation who, who does have, uh, that does have a particular type of leader that craves isolationism. It wants to be able to talk about global affairs without having to um, do its part um, so to speak, to move things along globally. Um, there is this way of thinking that if you get things right here on your own turf, that the rest of the world follows suit, which is you know, definitely some American hubris at play there. Um, I do not believe that we can solve our wealth gap by engaging in isolationism because we are, in my view, a global society. There are some things that are just, you know, undeniably linked. And so, you know, I, I know that uh, it may look like the Democrats have abandoned labor. Well, here's what's unfortunate. The Democrats haven't abandoned labor, but what they but what has been abandoned in American politics, I believe, is in order to get votes and to latch on to what's popular that's going to help maintain a base. In order to do that, you let go of other values, I think, that are harder to articulate. And you're no longer driving those um, critical conversations. Like, for instance, it makes me very sad that people in this country don't have more favorable attitudes toward the labor movement because of everything that labor did give the United States. I'm not saying that the labor movement didn't have corruption within it. There's corruption in every system, but it did a lot of good for the country. Now, labor still plays a big role in American politics, and it does so through campaign finance. So that is an area where labor will always have a seat at the table. They always have a voice. And, you know, when you get used to playing on the, on the uh, playing field a, a certain way, you just get used to your seat. You kind of settle in. But by no means is the labor movement dying, but it definitely does not have an amplified voice through politics. If, if it's ever amplified, it's through an issue, and you don't really realize that what you're going after is um, pushing for labor. So we saw a lot of this happen through health care reform um, in, in the early Obama days and even pre-Obama days. Um, so I feel like I'm talking a lot and I, I want to give Kathy a chance to talk too. Well, Kathy, you're, you're the opposite. You've written a lot for Reason Magazine. So I'm assuming you uh, hate labor and hate socialism and I hate workers' rights. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I want to get that child labor back. You know? <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, uh, I'm really not a doctrinaire libertarian. I mean, I um, 
probably what you would call a neoliberal and i know that's supposed to be like a curse word oh now. god and the chat right now <laughs> yeah 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 i'm sure they're gonna kill me in the chat yeah like uh, yeah come uh, you I'll, know. I'll defend you i'll defend you no yeah, worries come throw rock nags at the neoliberal right <laughs> yeah anyway so yeah i mean i believe in i i believe that you know markets are good i think that um you know, we are certainly at a level of wealth where we can afford to have a safety net that protects people from like the uh, worst vicissitudes of the market and, you know, it doesn't result in uh, people who are out of a job, you know, ending up on the street and so on and so forth. I mean, I think that, uh, uh, you know, obviously uh, there, there there is a lot of room for private charity, but I do think that you know, in a society at our level of development and sort of wealth and affluence, I think people do expect to have certain guarantees of a safety net where they don't, you know, have to uh, uh, rely on, you know, not always reliable private charity when, you know, they find themselves well, in hard times. But well, so at the same time, you know, I, I mean, I, I think there are a lot of interesting arguments that are being made right now about, for instance, whether conservatism uh, should go in a less free market direction and a more kind of family friendly direction, like, you know, more family leave, you know, more um, guarantees that would allow people to take some time off work when they have uh, young children. And I think those are interesting arguments. I mean, I don't really think that you know, but I mean, for me, I, I guess I'm not a libertarian with a kind of capital L. Uh, I'm a kind of small L libertarian in that I do believe that, you know, individual freedom is generally speaking best, you know, both in terms of markets and in terms of uh, social relations. Uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, there can be no restrictions on anything. I mean, really, like even the most doctrinaire libertarian will probably agree that there should be laws against like, you know, sex with underage children. So like no one, no one is really like almost no one is a libertarian, like yeah. all the way. Well, I guess, uh, I guess they'd advocate, scary they, you know, well, I guess that, they'd advocate for like more local uh, jurisdictions to be able to uh, level the legal. Legal, the legal process when it comes to yeah, a lot of these and things. certainly I think there there are uh, good you know discussions about w uh, what the best way to uh, is to enforce those laws. Like how do, how does the government overreach, for instance, in you know entrapping people into talking to what they think is minors? Like should we be setting those traps to you know flush out people who may be looking for minors on the internet? Or are we actually creating crimes where they otherwise wouldn't exist? I mean, those are all good questions, yeah. but I think everyone well, well, look, look at all the, uh, that back to, should uh, have some back, protections. Back to Back to Ed, uh, look at all those Nons Hunter uh, uh, YouTube uh, shows. So England is definitely uh, <laughs> right, doing right. its best there. But, but, but someone but in the chat. Well, um, you know, I do want to say, I do yeah, want to go gonna... back to what uh, what Jessica was saying, which I think is, is a good point about the wealth gap and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, the, the kind of shift toward identity issues. Because look, I mean, I do think that there is a kind of blind spot in um, libertarianism and, you know, sometimes in neoliberalism. Yeah. In so far as I think we really do, and I think by we, I also mean just sort of educated middle class people in general, we really do tend to underappreciate the extent to which uh, being born into a severely deprived background really can be an insurmountable obstacle. I mean, you know, it's it's all very well to say that you know you can pull yourself up by your bootstrap and the bootstraps, and certainly there are a lot of examples of people who have climbed out of like really grueling poverty and a horribly deprived background where they you know that they had mm. you know they, they were born to you know a single mother who was a junkie and you know managed to go to Harvard. I mean, you do get those cases, but it really does take you know, a very, very extraordinary strength of character and probably a lot of luck as well. And I think, you know, there, no one can really, no one in their right mind can deny that the family you're born into, like, has a huge impact on your chances in life. 
And I think, you know, you look at a lot of people who really do start with almost no chance of getting anywhere. Like if you're born into a family where, you know, your parents are barely literate and, you know, you you maybe like both your parents have substance abuse issues and you're abused as a child. I mean, yeah, like if you're a really extraordinary person and you have amazing luck, you know, you may climb out of that. But at the same time, you know, your chances are going to be severely reduced. And I do think that this is um, obviously this overlaps with race to the extent that you know, because of the historical legacy of racism, black people are much more likely to be in poverty, but it is not exclusively a racial issue. I mean, there are a lot of, well, you know, the majority of poor people in this country are white. And, you know, there are, there's actually been a growth of drug abuse issues and, you know, in certain white communities. And like we're, we've been seeing like, the, the white life expectancy going down in, in recent years and like the the the, the uh, and interestingly you know not many people know about those because everyone keeps saying that oh like the the racial problems just keep getting worse like the yeah, there is still obviously a black person is much more likely still to go to prison than a white person in this country but the gap has actually shrunk like there have been fewer black people and more white people going to prison so hmm. you know the, the just well, as a, as I a wanna, well two two things and two the things, class um... issue yeah if I can just real quick yeah, yeah, yeah. finish this like the, one of the things that really worries me about like all of this uh, and Jessica mentioned critical race theory like the, the whole like the language of whiteness and white privilege and whatnot I mean you know I mean I, I will not deny that like, the word white privilege is kind of a you know nails on a chalkboard board, you know word for me basically and it's not because like oh you know i am so aggrieved and you know my my little feelings are hurt because someone is suggesting that i'm privileged yeah i mean i am actually because you know i'm you know even though i'm an immigrant you know i was raised by well-educated parents with a lot of sort of cognitive you know capital where i you know i grew up yeah. reading books you know i know several languages and so on but so so, so I, were I, the nigerians that so, came over yeah. to america but i mean the the problem, the real problem for me with the, with this white privilege discourse, is that it allows people to treat you know like someone who grew up in a trailer park with you know a perpetually drunk uh, you know single mother and the uh, or, or even the, you know or whatever you know and an absent father. Uh, that person is going to be treated as privileged because he or she happens to be white. And there is actually evidence from research. I mean, I'm not making this up. There was a study a couple of years ago, which showed that white liberals uh, who are sort of primed with, like, if if they read a text uh, that emphasizes, that discusses white privilege, and then they're given this fictional story of like a severely deprived, like unemployed white guy who's grown up in, you know, very, very bad circumstances. And then you ask them, like, to what extent is this person responsible for his own problems? Like the people who previously to being given that story read a text about white privilege are going to be a lot less sympathetic to this unemployed white guy, you know, who's grown up with really, you know, in, in a very deprived background. So, I mean, really, the, this should be this should be the pitch. Like, this should be the pitch of the opposition to critical race theory. Look, like critical race theory uh, makes you hate poor white people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Um, yeah. Two things. One would be apparently um, because of uh, Liz Brunig um, having kids is ultra trad. Uh, totally right wing now even just having children below the age of 30 is seen as a terribly right wing but also someone in the chat oh my goodness i'm glad i never had kids at least oh I well then, then Nazi, you're you super know? low then yes um a, another thing someone said in the chat um i know the chat's going wild uh, as always they said what is labor nowadays silicon valley it's true i mean in terms of labor movement does it have a meaning either in america or even across the Atlantic? but to go back to ed um there's this issue. How how does labor in like in terms of not just the labor party but labor movement in Britain look, and how does Boris Johnson and the Conservatives look, or if you can even call them conservative? Because I know unheard, you guys recently had a whole like thing about the the shape around like the Conservative Party 
under the Johnson administration. So what do you even think the future of conservatism and the labor movement in Britain even looks like now across the political spectrum? And then I have another question for Ed about uh, what we discussed recently as well, but go for it, Ed. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Sure. Um, well, I don't know. Well, the, the conservative, I mean, they're basically going through the same thing. America went through the Great Realignment, but about 10, 15 years uh, later, so the Conservatives just won a by-election at Hartlepool, which is in the very far north of England. Um, so this is the opposite to like the Southern strategy that like the Conservatives picked up loads of seats in the north, where they used they were deeply hated 20 years ago, and Labour would get like 75% of these constituencies, very working-class yeah. constituencies, and now the Tories have picked them all up. While Labour are starting to do really well in quite well-to-do places in the south of England. So they're sort of switching over. It's a similar thing with, you know, it's happened in the States. You know, Labour Party is very popular amongst the sort of basic graduates. So, you know, urban, the big distinction is like London is overwhelmingly, my constituency now is like 50,000 majority for Labour. It's like completely pointless. When it used to be very um, hotly contested while um, small towns all vote conservative. So that's very different. I mean, it, basically British politics used to just be about class. You know, if you were posh, you'd vote yeah. Tory. And if you were like a Cockney, if you were working class in any way, you'd vote Labour. It was a very heavily thing. It was basically just about money. There was no, you know, we had, before the 1960s, for example, there was, I mean, there was no even cultural war concept because the sort of social values of both set of parties would have been very, very similar indeed. Um, it was just about how much money you split. And then from the 60s, it's the same as with America. It started, the Labour became a bit more liberal. Uh, but now, you know, the Labour, the Labour Party problem is that therefore they they basically got the Democrats, the US Democrats, but with like the American population of like 1984 or something. So mm. they just don't have enough people for their coalition. They they very much brought on, uh, very much copied the American, um, the Democrats kind of hold political philosophy, you know, again, that word woke, I hate it, but it's the only word I can think of. But there just aren't enough people like that in England. Um, now, amongst the young generation, there are, but I mean, I mean, like, you know, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, who's a bit of a, he's a bit of a drip, really. I mean, he's like a nice guy. I mean, he's apparently, it was rumoured, he was supposed to be, I don't know if was the Bridget Jones diary, if you've seen that, he's, the Colin Firth character was supposed to be a bit based on him and sort of, this human rights lawyer who's a bit of a, he wears, you know, Christmas jumpers and stuff. He's a bit, he's not having a good time of it. He just doesn't have the charisma. Unfortunately, the last guy, Corbyn, was just. Yeah, Jeremy Corbyn, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Corbyn had a huge like fan base amongst his followers, but he was just, he was just a kind of wrong one. You know, there was something, I mean, the voters really, this, the a lot of Labour voters really disliked him. You know, he supported, he supports, he supports, like, there's one thing about sympathising with Britain's enemies, like he actively supports Britain's enemies. You know, he goes out and um, meets them to, you know, he supports the IRA, he supports, he supports Hamas, he supports Hezbollah. He means, I don't even know, maybe that's exaggerated. He just says, yes, I met some people in Hamas and Hezbollah, but he met them quite a few times. Um, did you see the skit that Tracy Ullman did? The, yeah, the, yeah. yeah, that was, yeah, that, was that, that was great. That was very uh, yeah. accurate. So, I mean, he managed to sort of get hold of the party. And now they're sort of split um between all the various factions but i mean that is i suppose the left generally isn't it that's, that's the it's sort um, of like corbyn's like the bernie would have won crowd i don't know that's the vibe yeah. i get it's like they're the bernie yeah. would have, corbyn would have won I mean, yeah he was he was a fair bit more extreme than than um bernie to be fair yeah um, oh, right. i think so yeah Definitely. if corbyn would have won there would have it would have been, it would have been terrible i mean <laughs> I, lots of people i mean lots of people i know would have like definitely emigrated I would have got the old Irish passport, which I've left. But, but it is funny, though, because people, when they used to think, and, you, you know, in your, of that age group, that Gen X, like you remember Maggie Thatcher sort of deal, that was like the party of rich people, kind of like Ronald Reagan, like all of the industrialists voted for him. Yeah. But now it's become different. Now it's almost become like the more traditionally marginalized quote-unquote little englanders now they're voting for conservative mm, um and cool. you mentioned swindon i wonder if there's a certain person in swindon who helps sway <laughs> that oh never mind never, well this gonna... is actually this is actually what i wanted to get <laughs> I was at referring more to less. sargon of a cod but yes. <laughs> so this I was is... 
So this is the thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is the thing that I'm really curious about, and it relates to something Jessica was talking about earlier. Where Jessica, you were talking about there being like on, let's say, the conservative side, you have like the Sinclair networks, and it seemed like, and I'm not saying you were doing this intentionally, but it seemed like these two looked like like two heavyweight prize fighters that were mm -hmm. about to go at it for the soul of the country. While <laughs> let's say with um, Ed's book at least the vibe that I got is uh, you were talking about Robert Conquest's second law, that any organization not explicitly right-wing sooner or later becomes left-wing. And it also got me thinking to other things that I would say is in the spirit of the times today among a lot of people who uh, write about this stuff, where they see uh, conservatism in general as being the underdog. And they see, I wouldn't even use the word liberalism, I would use this more of like a quasi uh nanny state uh cancel culture uh uh sjw whatever you want to call it just like this whole oh, the march oh, of the times from, SJW. Yes, <laughs> yes this whole this whole spirit of the times from the tumblr culture down into our current institutions they see that as being uh, something that people within it, within that kind of system, would say, we're the underdogs, and we are going after all of these, you know, giants. Meanwhile, in truth, at least according to the people who see it that way, that is the establishment, and that is the overdog by a well, huge degree. Well, but also, Lev, another, another issue, too, would be that, like, Americans, I think you don't, well, I'm, you don't really have that same, like, the way that me and Ed do, where we come from countries that have state broadcasters, like the CBC here and the uh, obviously yeah. the BBC, like has such an immense influence over politics um, in, in the UK. I mean, I think maybe Americans, you don't take for granted. I mean, you kind of do have an unofficial state broadcasting system. Yeah. Because all the and, corporations and again, not, sort of not get to together. Say, but, not to yeah. say that there isn't this efficient amount of Americans, because if we're talking about not England, but America here, not to say, Jessica, you are right, that there is a sufficient amount of Americans that have a very particular, like their own way of looking at things very different from the NPR or any of that kind of stuff. But at the same time, to me, the question is, who hold, who wields power to actually change policy, not in a couple of years, but in terms of decades and in terms of centuries as we keep looking? So, Ed, I would love to hear from you on what you think would be going on here. And do you agree with this uh, Robert Conquest second law? And do you also agree that uh, people who are, let's say, more in the leftist position tend to see themselves in the underdog, while really they are the cultural overdog? Right. Uh yeah, I mean, the conquest law seems to happen. I mean, it's been disputed whether it's actually Robert Conquest who said it, but that's another issue. That seems to happen in, in so many different... I mean, academia is obviously the most extreme example where uh, we've had the similar pattern where academia in the 60s was like two to one uh, Labour to Conservative, pretty much the same as it was in the States. And it's now 50 to one, 100 to one in some areas completely. So in certain industries and for some reason conservatives seem to just sort of disappear um and a lot of that is just social pressure you know I, i've been to those situations that i've sort of lived in that world where it's kind of normalized to sort of make comments about conservatives and if that's if you if that becomes a kind of normalized thing then people eventually will either leave or just keep their mouth shut because no one really wants to be unless you're really like a narcissistic or sh sort of show off you, which you know obviously a lot of the people in the media are um most people don't really want to have like, arguments with politics so they don't want to be unpopular they don't want to be hated because they're sort of normal socialized people so you know you sort of those areas become eventually sort of doctrinaire i mean in the charitable sector is another example where you know most big british charities started these as sort of christian often evangelical christian groups yeah. And they slowly turned into sometimes keeping the name, sometimes not, but they basically turned into sort of like socialist, progressive uh, campaigning groups, and they openly campaigned politically. So they're, they're also, I mean, Conquest's Law, the ultimate one was, um, you know, Oxfam was the main one. There was some Amnesty International, Oxfam were the ones people often talk about. Um, but in terms of the rebellion thing, yes, definitely. I mean, like, Rebellion is very attractive as an idea and being a rebel and being a, you know, a good looking rebel is like one of the kind of cultural archetypes of the modern world and modern progressivism basically did grow out of rebellion in the 60s in the States and in France. Uh, also, you know, in the time of the 1968 re uh, rebellion, not only were there, there are pretty good reasons for the students, you know, American students are getting drafted into Vietnam. But most of the corporation, the universities at the time were still quite conservative dominated. Uh, 
big business was overwhelmingly conservative. The army was obviously overwhelmingly conservative. Most of these institutions were very conservative. You know, you go forward to 2020 in the process about BLM, apart from the demented man in the White House, the, I mean, American institutions and certainly British institutions are not conservative anymore. They're not against BLM, whatever they stand for. Um, you know, you had the ridiculous thing, the Star Wars actor saying, you know, I'm going to support BLM. I don't care my, if this does to my career. So there's no way that's going to harm his career, saying I support Black Lives Matter. That's just, it's not, you know, you're still living off that sort of 1960s glamour. There's a, a common thing in, you know, British um, comedians um, on British publishing and the debate over British history in schools where they, there's often things, well, oh, we're going to teach you the, the stuff you were never taught at school. And this idea that, we all went to school where there was sort of like hardline right wing history teachers teaching us about how great the British Empire was. That hasn't happened for like 80 or 90 years. You'd have to be like a geriatric to have experienced that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. this, I went to school, all the teachers were like hardline Trotskyites. It was a sort of. <laughs> yeah. but that's still, you know, there is still sort of the long run of this memory of this time when things were still culturally concerned. And I just don't think it's true. I mean, in Britain, there is, I mean, I've got friends in the military and they say, obviously, the top brass generals are not particularly progressive because you're, you know, that kind of person doesn't go into the business of killing people. But that kind of the ideology is all. I mean, the British Army is, all, is just full of equality and diversity glasses now. It's the same crap everywhere. Yeah. And, and there, there is was a comment uh, from uh, Philip Daniel, a uh, great uh, friend of ours, Philip Daniel. He says, wokeness is just, and I'm curious, Jessica, what you particularly think of this? This is a spicy one. And wokeness is just another means by which the upper bourgeois neglects its noblesse oblige, projecting its power upon the powerless through a series of. Uh, indefinable abstractions and this is also something that i read in uh, your book ed which if you don't mind i'm just going to read real quickly here most of uh, all political correctness is about control accepting opposing views in the marketplace of ideas is not natural to our species and in only a small number of societies have people over many centuries of violence been able to reach a political settlement where this is done. Much more instinctive is the urge to control and repress desires that are the strongest in the young, who are the least tolerant and accepting of nuance, and therefore the most attracted to authoritarian ideologies. In fact, part of the attraction of being a young politically correct activist is that you get to be the orthodoxy police and call out people who are ideologically impure. Pure. So when politically correct activists change the language, it's not mostly for the sake of kindness, but to ruin their opponents. Political correctness is about controlling dialogue, and so altering the meaning of words so that it becomes harder to articulate particular view viewpoints. And without anyone being able to do so, a political viewpoint becomes unorthodox, controversial, offensive, and even illegal. If you cannot articulate ideas because the language has made them appear extreme or dangerous, then those ideas cannot be justified or given due weight in the political arena. So there we go. I just wanted to lay all that but, out. But also, yeah. but also I wanted to have yeah. to get Alex involved because this idea that woke, I mean, for lack of a better term, let's call it international progressivism, uh, is a way of like the ruling class to sh sort of shed its obligation to the lower classes. That's a very interesting idea. So I know, Alex, you've talked about it in your show, but yeah, yeah. please, Jessica, then add yeah. then. Yeah. So, I, you know, this is a fascinating conversation to me. Um, I will say that purity, pol all movements, all activist movements have um, a, pure, a, a foundation built on purity. This idealism that, you know, very quickly, um, because one group and its influence, they, they like to maintain what they consider purity, purity, which then oppresses another group. So then another group finds a way to seize power and they develop their own rhetoric to fight back against that. But while they're doing it, they they too start engaging in purity politics and so all of this any any sort of activist movement you see you know usually would start off with this idea that people just want equality but really what it comes down to more than anything is that people just want power and one thing that you see play out time and again in the united states and i, I say this as you know a person who exists on the left um and i you know i kind of wear all shades blue but I think that this country has a history of just, it's just one group after another seeking power. It is way less about equity than it is power. And I think that it's just because it comes down to human nature. I think that 
the United States has a a lot of very <laughs> a lot of um, image issues. I think that there uh, a lot of activist movements are often taken over by people who are basically sociopaths. I think that they want um, a lot of attention for themselves. I think that if somebody had the time and the money to look at these large institutions that had um, big budgets to, um, you know, for instance, go after, uh, you know, reforms that could lead to a less racist society, or you just pick an issue, what movement are we actually seeing? what progress are we actually seeing? You have corporations that make these large contributions to different groups and they're like, okay, now go do the work. But what has the work actually created? Because I come from um, South Arkansas. So that's, you know, it's, it's in, to me, the heart of the South um, in the United States. The small town that I grew up in was surrounded by a lot of other smaller towns with great poverty. I can tell you this, those city bank dollars and all of those, the, um, the other large contributions that move into these nonprofits or these other groups, you're not seeing those dollars in those communities. There is a stopping point, I think, where you have an elite group of people and they may not even view themselves as elite, but they are the ones who dance in these circles and they do this work that's funded by other larger entities or you know, funded by small dollars too. But then the question becomes, how far do those dollars actually stretch? And I would argue not far because I know exactly where to go all throughout this country to find poverty and to find um, people who are truly othered and, and they are always, almost always othered based on their wealth. And it is through those means precisely that people are held down. Um, you know, I am not saying any of this to be critical of any movement that is going on in this country right now because any of these movements that happen, they are a reaction to something else that has already happened. You know, it is, you know, without question, we have a problem with police violence in this country. And the black community has decided to speak up against it. Oddly enough, the white community hasn't been speaking up um, until the black community started engaging the white community, because there are a lot of people who are white who are also killed by police officers in this country, but you didn't see the same movement. So through BLM, there's been attention called to police violence. W would that it be said, also, oh, go on, sorry. Oh, that said, you know, you, there are rules of engagement. And so now there, you hear people in the white community saying, well, why aren't we talking about uh, police violence toward white people? And it's like, well, first of all, no one was ever stopping you. But what you can't do is go and co-opt Black Lives Matter, because that movement is very specific in what end it wants to achieve. You can't take their movement. You can go do your own thing and drive that conversation. But now what's happening is that there's resentment. And what I hate to see is that in any political movement, you will always have an operative who finds a way to create a wedge within the movement or to create a way to diminish said movement by um, picking on the, the inconsistencies or the ways the movement doesn't extend to everyone. So basically in this country, you have a lot of people who um, in any movement who want power and they're looking out for themselves, but those people are also susceptible to the argument structure of, oh, look at how you're being left out by this movement. There is the, the constant mental gymnastics that are played out in this country on the activism landscape, no matter what your political persuasion is or what your cause is, it's extraordinary. And it's had a corrosive effect on this country, but there's no such thing as a pure movement. I mean, you, you asked this question earlier about how policy is made and who has the most say and who will have the most say over time. Well, we have a lot of money in our politics and a lot of corporate interest and no control over that right now. And it is precisely because of our free speech laws. So you look at policy, and we're not moving anywhere near what's best for all. And so at the core of that, the question becomes, are people really wired toward doing what is best for all?
Well, and a lot no. of people. No. Oh wait, wait, real quick. Well, we we've heard it first. We... Jessica says we need uh, white yeah. people to organize. <laughs> no. Okay. 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 Oh, I we did can... not. Re real quick. Real quick. We can disagree <laughs> on whether this is indeed the case. I'm not sure so myself. But again, there has been conversations on the internet about, let's say, when people take a look at a movement like BLM. I'm not sure we're getting that much people who are in opposition saying like, "Oh, well, we want our own uh, BLM." I think. What they seem to be getting at is their view of it is that a lot of these, let's say, Antifa people are basically the upper class. They are agents, as they mm. see them, as the upper class. The police don't really go after them. The judges don't go after them. So in a way, they see it. To them, it's like this big government system that's extracting the wealth from the United States, that's screwing everybody over, while at the same time, tactfully, like at the right times, employ their shock troops in certain times in order to cause damage and they're the upper class shock troops they have their drug problems and all that but they're probably like a lot of them are probably like you know antifa people kids of rich people kids of doctors and lawyers <laughs> so that's the way they see it i'm not sure if that is indeed the case but i just wanted to plant this um um you know kind of like an alternate view of the way that people may be seeing these things and i'm curious so what your thoughts are on that well, it's just Antifa gets way, way too much credit. It is not anywhere near as widespread and as large as people like to make it out to be. And it's also, I mean, you know, is it frustrating to people to see, to turn on the news and see, you know, members of that particular group engaging in violent acts in the country or engaging in destructive acts? Yes, because then, you know, what they don't see um, is any sort of force back onto that group. So then you have a way to exploit, you know, um, differences between people to say, oh, well, look, they, they get away with this. That's not fair. When in reality, they don't get away with as much as people like to make, you know, to make out that they do, but, but whatever, that's all about it's perception wars and it's our media. Um, but also <laughs> Antifa is just, it, it's just not what it's made out to be. I, I just don't know how else. But, but, but are there but are there stats out there that we can take a look at that would say uh, this many Antifa people were let go of by what people would describe as being, let's say, activist judges? Because that's the kind of stuff that gets mm -hmm. spread out. I'm not sure if that is indeed the case. But if it is, then the picture that gets, uh, you know, that people make is that we are currently living at a time where whether there is some master plan that makes sense, if only you knew about it, or whether this is absolute just like a big power grab the way they look at it is that the cards are stacked against uh you know regular people wealth is extracted i've, I've already said enough you know that's the picture mm -hmm. that gets planted that gets planted i'm not sure if that's a real one i mean ed even though you're in england england has its own antifa and all that i'm curious where would you put the responsibility of let's say the uh activist ruling class or whatever you want to call it like the people who have enough money resources power and i'm not excluding places like russia as well i think russia also funds blm antifa all of that but anyway i'm curious ed what you think of uh, that particular influence how high is it are people who are complaining about this making a mountain out of a molehill or no um it's funny how a lot it's a lot of conservatives have sort of become basically from sort of marxists now it's all about sort of class analysis isn't it and um it's the progressives are just collecting their <laughs> protecting their class interests. And I have to admit, I'm, you know, it kind of makes sense to me more now. I wonder if that's just the ultimate sign of like losing you because so well, kind of Marx explains everything now. Um, oh God. Uh, I mean, if you go, if you go into the nice parts of, you know, you're in a nice part of London um, when you see the little hand-drawn BLM stickers and posters in the windows uh, done by the kids. And, you know, you see them all sorts of nice, uh, ish areas near me it is a kind of uh is oh, you know of... can i just interject for a sec because uh, i have a kind of similar story where i uh the other day i went for a drive to the to, to like the really posh neighborhood around here like we have a neighborhood around here where like the, the lawyers like the, the you know the, the rich people live and uh in front of this like three-story house with and I, I went there basically to look at the trees in bloom you know it's spring so there is this very very posh house with columns and everything and trees and and there is a blm sign in front of it and i thought <laughs> you know i will bet you anything that the person living inside that house is not actually black i mean you know i didn't see them but like i would be really really shocked if they were black just you know it's... so it's funny but it's funny what <laughs> you said ed 
But uh, Alex, I wonder, should we regret this uh, red brown alliance thing that we're going on on Twitter uh, with the post left people? I don't know. Is it true that we're losing like the far right is losing because now we're talking about class? I mean, it is an interesting issue how class issues are now. It's like there's a, a reversal going on where more right explicitly right wing people are talking about class interests. I don't know. It's really we live in yeah. crazy times. I don't know. It's a it's it's a, a a level of abstraction that I think the the right has ignored for a long time uh, to its detriment, and now mm. it's it's coming back. And you know, a, a, a lot of the chat about cultural Marxism and then how Marx is you know kind of pulling the strings from from behind the curtain of history and destroying everything. You know, people are starting to question that narrative as well, and are seeing Marx as a useful lens on to looking at uh, at at things from finally a very uh, useful perspective for the right because you actually have essentially you have this kind of techno feudalism that's happening and surprisingly marx is, is quite useful to, to analyze that and he he makes good predictions if you actually take that um but um so i think yeah you know if it's useful use it and i think the right is doing that at the moment and you know why not and it also kind of dissolves this whole iron narrative about who's a marxist and you know spot the commie and you know which was kind of like this paranoia that the right's been caught in for for a long time so i think it's, it's nice to to loosen up the, the terminology a bit uh but uh, i, I want to also go back a little bit further to to uh the to conquest second law um and there was um there's you know the idea that you know your society uh there, there are always moral assumptions in a society and our society's moral assumptions, you know, they're, they're not necessarily explicitly Christian, but they are all tied into equality, personal autonomy, tolerance. Um, and I think conquest second law works and it's been predictive because that is the only direction that you can uh, gain power by pushing the envelope. So you, you don't gain power by uh, setting boundaries or putting in limits, you know, you lose power by doing that. But if you come to the scene and say, okay, I am more tolerant, you should be more tolerant, you impose that, you know, that moral fervor into the direction of tolerance, or, you know, more personal autonomy, more equality, more that that's, that's exactly the fertile ground for power. So that's why I'm not necessarily surprised that mm. conquest second law makes good predictions. And that's the direction everything's I, I, heading. I am curious. Because the uh, images of thought yeah. of that society. I, I am curious, though. Jess, Jessica, would you agree with uh, Alex's statement as far as uh, uh, it, it has to be this push for power? That's the only way any change can be accomplished. Or do you disagree? No, you ha you have to push. You you have to push, and you have to be strategic. How you push, you have to be strategic with your coalition building. I think that oftentimes when you um, see groups emerge and they don't, especially here in the U.S., when you forego coalition building, you start out at a disadvantage because then you're having to count on the slow climb of your brand or your your group kind of catching fire and people saying, oh, I want to join that. You're usually better served when you can find allies and then move forward that way because the reality is, is that your allies will have resources that you don't, connections that you don't, and given the way this country is structured, it's, it's quite, it's actually just easier to operate that way. Um, that said, when you're wanting to send a message about something that's incredibly controversial, it's not always easy to build allies around that. You know, I, again, I can use BLM as an example. We know why BLM started. And we have now seen the different types of people who have emerged to support the group. But would those people say to you, I'm, a, you know, I am part of BLM, or would they make the distinction and say, I support BLM? So I think that when it comes to power and um, pushing a movement or trying to grow a movement, you know, there's always going to be questions about what people identify with. And so um, force doesn't always come easy. People are not always quick to say that they want to engage in, you know, a forceful action. And um, because if that were the case, I think that the BLM movement would be much larger than it is, quite frankly. And then also, you know, I, I know the point was made earlier that you can walk into nice neighborhoods and see these signs made by children in windows. And, and that is something that I, I see all the time. I mean, I, I get it, you know, like BLM, BLM has found its way into homes that it, you know, that 30 or 40 or 50 years ago wouldn't have. And now it's, 
it's almost become a way of saying this is the right way to be. This is the nice way to be. Well, M Michael has a comment about that. He said all the upper middle class parroting of social orthodoxy is mm -hmm. just them navigating the waters to maintain their position. Oh, I'm sure that that is true for some people. I do believe that. And I also believe that there are a lot of people who genuinely care and they're trying to figure out mm. what, what does it mean to be supportive? What does it mean to be a part of a movement? Where is my place? Um, you know, I try not to approach everything with complete cynicism. I, I think that there's room. <laughs> not, not as Machiavellian as some people are, I guess. But uh, Yeah, but there's a place for it. I understand yeah. that. But when it comes to the bigger picture here, Jessica, and this is to everybody as well, what do you think is going to come next? Because if uh, Alexandra is right in this force being the only thing that would create any of these changes, and I would say most people are not going to be the heroes. Like uh, Ed was writing before in his uh, wonderful book, that a lot of, let's say, this heroic action that these celebrities do, they're so heroic when they criticize these giants that don't exist anymore or are so small that there there's no risk in criticizing certain structures of power. Yet for the structures of power that do exist, uh, that, let's say, would get them fired, would get their social circles in a tizzy and exclude them. We don't really get people who have a lot of, let's say, reputation at stake to be able to come out and say things that would result in these things happening. I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen this, like the celebrities coming out for something that would never, ever get them in trouble. I mean, that's par for the course. So the question to me is, if most people are going to act like that, what exactly is the future going to look like? And I would love to uh, start with Ed. Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, are ever, people ever going to do that? I mean, I, I, I just don't think that's, that's ever really the case. I mean, as much as conservatives, you know, complain. I mean, I say this in my book, you know, we complain because now we're kind of losing. But when the shoe was on the other foot, in most cases, conservatives, you know, 50 years ago in America, you'd go to jail if you were basically yeah. politically, you know, you won't get cancelled by losing your job. You go down, you know, we had... I know I complain that the theatre would never ever tackle a sort of potentially uncomfortable issue, but you know, until the late sixties, there was actual you know censorship. Um, what would actually take people? I just don't think. I mean, I think the main thing is, I do, I do, unfortunately, have that cynical view that people do sort of take the noise in a kind of maliciously uh, cynical way that they just adopt what makes them sound. You know, if you if you have an eight million pound house in Hampstead and you have Black Lives Matters. Yeah, sure, it makes you a good person. You know, maybe, you know, maybe you don't have to go out and then um, do something about equality. But obviously, I mean, obviously the kind of this, the ideology promoted by BLM doesn't really harm people with eight million pound houses, does it? It doesn't really require them. I mean, it's a, an ideology about equality, but it's not like previous um attempts at equality, you know, under like, you know, Bolshevism, where, you know, the, you'd actually get your property taken away. And if you're unlucky, your lives, it's, it is a sort of um, a worldview that very much does favor the well off. And there's no denying about that. So, you know, it's hard not to be cynical. I mean, the most cynical thing is, uh, this is, a you know, seen the American thing is, you can't, you don't really get it in England, but people with the BLM signs, and then also those signs, in, you know, against allowing any more housing in their area, which is a kind of meme I've seen, a pet, very popular in like San Francisco and places like this, where, you know, people are saying I'm all in favor of BLM, but I'm also in favor of them, the strictest zoning rules, which basically, yes, mm -hmm. yes, you know, yeah. they're a form of segregation mm -hmm. themselves. And that's always the S same thing with the Upper West Side in Manhattan when uh, de Blasio brought the homeless in, they sued the city. Right. So, I mean, every, you know, everyone's saying, yeah, you know, great, open borders are great, except that in my particular neighborhood, I want NIMBYs. Strict... Mm -hmm. NIMBYs, a lot of them. So yeah. NIMBYs, you know, this is our complaint in England. NIMBYs are basically, even though NIMBYs are, you know, mainly old, older people, conservative voters, they're basically killing England. They're sort of killing our civilization completely. But, you know, NIMBYism is, you know, a revealed preference, isn't it? So it's, it's, yeah. We should take people at, at what their word, what they actually do, rather than what they say. It just becomes very empty to say, "Yeah, oh, great, I support BLM." I mean, that, 
But then there's the other side of it for me, which I've said on previous podcasts, which is part of me thinks that certain movements that come about, they get co-opted, but that may not be a good, a bad thing. Kind of like how the press sometimes writes yada, 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 and that's a good thing. So in this case, it would be, let's say, support for uh, BLM or Antifa or, you know, mis- minimizing certain damage uh, that uh, that gets done. One thing that may happen here, and again, this is me putting on my uh, cynical Machiavellian hat, never mind the ice cream truck music in the background for anybody who hears it, but when I put that hat on, I think that certain people out there may actually, you know, care about the future of the country if we're both talking about the UK and uh, America. And like we could say, when the UK was uh, in such a state that perhaps there would have been communism that would have been brought about, the elites were smart enough to know that we have to implement certain reforms, we have to implement certain welfare uh, programs in order for people not to be drawn to something much worse than we could ever imagine, as we've seen what happened in the Soviet Union. So to me, I'm going to give the devil his due, or I'm going to, let's say, play devil's advocate and say, maybe there are people within the elite, or whatever you want to call them, that do co-opt a lot of these movements for the sake of being able to steer them and control them in such a way as to make the minimum amount of damage. Maybe I'm just being uh, naive about this, but I just wanted to throw that in as a possible uh, situation here. Hmm, that's, 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 I mean, that would be the, the best possible. I mean, the, the best thing about, you know, the best outcome with, for BLM is that it ends up being a complete grift, which it has been sort of, allegations that you know people use marxism as just kind of branding to they say oh we're marxists and then they go off and you know make themselves wealthy and and nothing and it's just a way of basically occupying people who would otherwise be extreme and dangerous you know give them something to do i think the problem with the whole the ideology coming out of the american moment you know we talk about equity is that you're talking about something that's that is basically (laughs) impossible to say impossible impossible to achieve (laughs) I just been watching so much Simpsons. Um, it's impossible. It's basically That's impossible. Impossible, yeah. <laughs> impossible, right? It's like equality is impossible. It cannot. It, it's never been achieved in any society. And every campaign in history, in kind of multicultural states, where there's always been some groups who ended up wealthier, every attempt to turn this into equality has always ended really badly. It's always then turned into hatred and, and bloodshed and violence. What? The American left seems to hope for now a society on quality of outcomes is completely unachievable. It's never going to happen. So, like, if you talk about, you know, I'm reading Orlando Figg's a book about the Russian Revolution right now, and by God, that's depressing. And I've, I haven't really got to the really depressing bit. It's still czarist time. That's depressing enough. But you know, there were like so many. You just think there are so many things you could have done to alleviate people's misery to stop this happening. Um, but there are certain. There are certain things that are just basically unachievable. And yeah. if your ideology is a quality of outcome, as you know, he ended up the most extreme group took over there who believed a quality of outcome was possible. It's just we're swimming in our similar waters in terms of utopian ideas. And to me, it just seems it seems so strange that America's upper class have taken this on when it's a country which has got like, so much rights and has got so much personal freedom and is the country everyone wants to move to and yet they're sort of they're throwing away that capital on a completely impossible Mm. ideological goal which this may seem like it comes from oh yes well no you said something interesting in the comments um are these movements merely co-opted by corporate interests or are they at least in part the children of corporate interests in the sort of global liberal system as a whole so that's kind of like an interesting chicken and egg I mean, I tend to believe the latter, but that's, you know. No, but look at liberalism in general as far as what came out of uh, liberalism versus what came out of, like Ed was mentioning, czarism. Because there you had, uh, you know, the transformation from czarism to capitalism. You could say just as likely liberalism will always cause totalitarianism in terms of, like, fascism. You know, like, liberalism would lead to fascism, much like you could say liberalism would lead to communism. One thing would always lead to another thing, which is why I think that I'm personally a liberal. I consider myself to be a liberal. But I know that with that, yes, I know you're shaking your head. With that <laughs> comes a very huge responsibility to maintain 
this, uh, you know, this pressure that always comes about. But as I see it, all the other sides, if we're talking about both people on the reactionary right or the reactionary left, their outcome would be to have a dictatorship, either of a strong man or of the dictatorship of the proletariat coming in there and fixing things up, which to me is a recipe not only for disaster, but they're going to be the ones against the wall first. So that is just my own way of looking at these things. But you know what I'm curious about, though? How different really is Ed from Jessica? Because I know that you are different. I mean, obviously, you're in different countries. And I would say that, Ed, your political uh, affiliation would be different than, let's say, more, let's say, further right uh, Americans or even like American conservatives. Like I'd say yours would be a little bit mellower if I'm uh, if I'm not mis mispeaking here. But really, Jessica, what's the big difference between you and Ed? From what I see, like you guys see things in a very similar way. Like what exactly would be the big difference here? I think we do see things very similarly. And I think that, you know, Ed has the benefit of living in a place that has uh, a lot more history, a lot more experience uh, dealing with um, certain types of activism. You know, I, and I would argue, um, I mean, obviously, of a, a variety of hardships over a long span of time. Um, you know, the United States, while it shares its borders with, um, you know, two other countries, it's just not the same. I mean, I think if you, you know, you live in Europe, you have so many other challenges, whereas here in the United States, people have had um, far fewer challenges. I'm not trying to diminish any of the struggles that have happened in this country, but we're still a very young nation. And we, um, you know, a lot of people are learning how to be activists. Yes, we had the Civil War. Yes, we had slavery. We've had lots of um, significant, uh, you know, chapters of, of strife in our short history. But I think that learning how to be an activist um, is not easy. I think that activism, there's an entire industry built around activism in this country that has led to um, a lot of what you see being very performative. And I think that performative nature of activism is incredibly frustrating to people, especially people who truly do believe in a cause. I also think that it's not wrong to criticize any any movement um, where, a, you know, the performative nature ends up kind of um, undercutting the movement altogether. And I think that when corporations start engaging in these in these movements, it cheapens the movements. It's great to have corporate buy-in. Uh, you know, I get first, you're like, oh, that's really great. Nike stands with us and that's going to help us out a lot. But then you start looking around and you're like, wait, did you really support us? Or did you do this just so you wouldn't have, um, you know, trouble with your sales? Were you looking to boost your sales? I mean, I, I think that's a real challenge here in this country. And it doesn't just happen with um, political issues. You've seen it um, with other issues. It, it could be... Um, you know, we've had an ongoing conversation about breast cancer in this country and how we turn everything pink when we're wanting to draw attention to breast cancer. And I have plenty of friends and family members who have struggled with breast cancer, who have lost their lives to this disease. And so, you know, when you're on the receiving end of the tragedy, you will welcome all the help that you can, even if you don't necessarily uh, agree with it or think it's the best way to move forward, but you accept it. Um, and I think that a lot of activists find themselves in that position, too. So, you know, it is strange when you see uh, celebrities, you know, with their multiple houses and their great platforms, you know, showing up at the last minute and saying something um, just to be a part of this, you know, a part of a movement whenever it's convenient. But think about all of the people who have these massive platforms and don't say anything at all. Um, you know, I'm not a, uh, a Swifty. I guess a Taylor Swift uh, fan. Yeah. I don't have anything against her that just isn't for me. But for the longest time, she was criticized for not speaking out um, about her political views. And she didn't do it until, yeah. you know, the 2020 election cycle. Um, she had and, to do the ritual. She had to submit. So she <laughs> had to bow her head. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, it's, uh, that becomes the question. Um, but why do we go to these yeah. people for political views, though? Like these people, I'm well, sorry, wait, but they're ahead. absolutely. Wait, Ed, you okay. had something yes. to say? I was about to get there because yes. I, oh, yes. then I, I have absolutely. I, I don't really care what any celebrity has to say about anything. I, I truly just <laughs> don't care. I don't seek Based. that out from them. And, um, you know, and I also think that there are people like there is a view in this country where it's like, wait, did someone speak up because they felt that the mob was at their back door and they were making them yeah. speak? 
or were they speaking up for their own gain because it was advantageous in the moment to do so? Um, or were they speaking out of genuine care and concern? And so I know that the best way to be as a person, you always want to be, um, you know, you want to be mindful of what's happening around you, but it's also nice to give people a little bit of grace. Um, but that might be my naivety speaking. But, but, but the last one is actually the most concerning for me, the true, the true believers, because mm -hmm. it takes a long time. Really, it does. It takes wisdom. It takes accumulating history and wisdom and all that stuff in order to form an opinion about so many things that most people regardless of their intention, have no idea about. And mostly it's just been something that's from their childhood. They've been indoctrinated in a certain way of seeing the world around them. And uh, what do we do with that? Like, that seems to be a pretty big problem, which is why I'm happy we don't live in a democracy. We live in a representative democracy, that at least there's a little bit of leeway there, which may be fading. I'm not sure. Like, Ed, how do we deal with that aspect of it, this Cassandra uh, vibe that people get from conservative uh, people who, let's say, shout doom and gloom and nobody wants to hear it because it spoils the party you know what i mean like that seems to be the energy well, that no, you but were also portraying like in, in the in, book but also you like uh ed you had a stream about like how the contemporary like british society is going through like almost like an explicit like cultural american colonization in terms of the whole uh megan markle thing so about like celebrityism like now it's in, even like invading the uh politics of the royal family so it's like yeah it's like we, uh, yeah we're completely um yeah we're, we're completely brainwormed by american politics but you know, we, have, <laughs> we have the least resistance to it and it always gets translated into a slightly rubbish way to us it's like when they tried to having cheerleaders in football in, in what you call soccer they tried doing that once and it just it just just doesn't work in england it's just the same way that american politics american kind of cultural issues you know, even the Karen thing gets translated in it. And Karen is a completely different, like Karen is like a very working class name in England. So it doesn't even make sense. But people just <laughs> repeat these phrases uh. here in America, which make no real, like they're repeating, like, you know, baseball say. Um, and in the Cassandra issue, I mean, sometimes Cassandra's wrong. Sometimes there aren't loads of, you know, Greek guys inside the, the horse. And, you know, she's just been, <laughs> been a new monster. But um, yeah. that, that is the thing is that no one wants to really hear pessimists are, you know one of the things pessimists are quite depressing to be around and, and it gets a bit tiresome so you don't really i mean the thing is obviously it comes down to balance eventually doesn't it i mean my main problem is that you know we have runaway liberalism it's sort of when liberalism is a attractive quality in people and everyone wants to and people especially people now are so much more states like anxious about their status because it's so much harder to know what you're but, but is it even fair to call it liberalism no i know i say liberalism i mean yeah i mean progressivism because that's a bit I mean, I, I, I'm not anti-liberal in the sense I, I kind of respect liberalism as an, as an ideology. And I wouldn't say that you know, the woke people aren't. I mean, the liberals are the people who you know, signed the Harper's letter. That's why I would call the liberals. Yeah. But I know, like people like, people like Bill Maher, for instance. Like I would consider Bill Maher to be more of a liberal right, yeah. than a lot of people who. Uh... Yeah, yeah. And he's very, he's very like, un, he's a very good party line. And that's, um, but that, I mean. And one of the telling things about the Harper's letter was the people who were signing it versus the people denouncing it was the age gap, which to me is a kind of telling thing. You know, the younger people aren't aren't so liberal anymore. But I mean, as Kathy says, that's been a thing since progressivism. You know, the radicals of the 60s who were the kind of forerunners of today's work, they were very anti-liberal. They, you know, proclaimed how much they hated liberalism and hated liberals. But yeah. it seems that the character of like the dour pessimist is gain gaining more cultural traction among younger people like the peter hitchens disposition i mean you could probably call it of like standing against the world right. and being against time itself and saying no i mean that's to me almost that's become romanticized i mean maybe it's just the circles i travel in but yeah, yeah I, mean, I wonder about that i think the same but then i think yeah that probably is just come hang around in loads of doom mongers right so yeah. um, <laughs> but there has to be a certain point though like to to put a bit of a white pill in here as far as the future not and i'm not saying this is a future that let's say conservatives were would be preferential towards i think this would be a, a future that both let's say conservatives and liberals in the classic sense would be preferential towards it would be the kind of future where let's say the people who are growing up right now who are going to school who are being indoctrinated by a lot of things that uh, you know just make them feel really ill at ease like this whole power play that you were writing about in your book uh, that I was uh, reading earlier on here 
the young people who are growing up with that and who have access to the internet and who have access to, you know, other points of view, I think that, and I think it's already starting to happen a little bit, is that they may start looking at the current establishment. Because again, when everything becomes popular among the establishment, I wonder how long will it be able to last in terms of being something that's considered to be culturally rebellious, as opposed to being, let's say, like the lady from uh, Harry Potter, because you've thrown in a couple of Harry Potter references yourself at in your book. And yeah. it was the, uh, <laughs> yes, it was the yeah. teacher who was wearing pink. I don't remember her name right now, but she was like, you know, she put a lot of rules into Hogwarts. And does anybody know who I'm talking about here? She was just like a very, you know, oh, she, she, God, please let's move on from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. No, no, but the point is, oh, the God. point is, this is something that Tim Dillon, Western civilization, right? Yes. This is something that Tim Dillon was talking about earlier in this podcast that I was listening to today, that uh, there are these people out there who have become moralists, who have become people that are so preachy and tell people what they are or aren't allowed to think and have absolutely zero to offer other than their gender identity and their sexual preference with Without those things and without being against hate and anything you could put in here as being the negative, they don't really have any spirit. They're completely empty. And my guess is that slowly but surely there are going to be people out there, young people who are going to be growing up in this, who will see those people as being spiritually empty and will see them as just being these idiotic moralists that love to preach about you know how wonderful their farts smell and how good they are and eventually there's going to be more of a rebellion against that because i can't think that this would be bearable for that long amount of time among the next generations that are coming up i could be wrong i'm curious uh i'm curious what you think um can i chime in here Absolutely. And then, yeah. Ed, I know you have to leave soon, so we'll just do like oh, one round. Uh, yeah, yes. I should so. probably be heading out too. So, yeah, I just want to bring up a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I mean, I do think that in terms of uh, young people, uh, for the young people growing up today who are right now in school, uh, this is now the sort of dominant ideology that uh, you know, may very well come to be seen as uncool because that's what their teachers are pushing at them, you know. And I mean, there is a kind of weird symbiosis, I think, between the teachers and the woke kids, you know, because there is also a very uh, kind of aggressive activist contingent of, of woke teenagers. But I, I mean, I suspect that this is not really popular with a lot of uh, with a lot of teens who are not a part of this clique. So I don't know. I mean, I think that there may very well be a, a kind of mounting pushback. I think some of the other things that need to be considered. Uh, one is. Um, I do think that the uh, the sort of the the fallout from BLM, the fallout from you know a lot of these current events, probably is going to lead to a spike. I mean, it's already I think leading to a spike in crime. Uh, because there is a kind of de-policing. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the Times Heather Square. I just want to say real quick, Times Square is turning into Crime Square. Anyway, go go on. Ah, well, see, I was in New York. I was in New York for the, uh, you know, crime-ridden 1980s, which were not as bad as the 70s, I think. But it was still pretty bad because, I mean, I had a part-time job in New York uh, in uh, in the late 80s. And, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, pretty scary, you know. There were... Yeah. Uh, um, you know, the, the, and I think people definitely had a very strong sense that, you know, there were places where you didn't go, you know, after a certain, after a certain time. I mean, I knew people who had been mugged like six or seven times. Um, yeah. My grandma, they, my grandma got mugged as well in Foster Avenue when we moved oh. here in 93. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and, and I think, you know, if you look at the spike in murders, and that, by the way, is primarily affecting the Black community, and that's, you know, the, 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 the hike in crime rates in general. I mean, it's primarily, it, it's not the people living in those big mansions, you know, with the BLM signs in front of them, who are going to be affected by this. And like, even people in the wealthier parts of New York, you know, obviously you can't keep you know, all crime confined to the poor neighborhoods, but, you know, primarily that's kind of where they stay. Yeah. So, you know, I think that there will be um, eventually 
uh, an anti-crime backlash. I mean, there, it, it, it's weird because when you look today at the discourse around uh, like the 1994 crime bill, which uh, Biden had to basically disavow, you know, and which mm. you know Hillary mm-hmm. Clinton was running away from, people forget that the people like in the 1980s and 90s, the push for really tough law and order measures came in very large part from the black community. Like the black, the Congressional Black Caucus was supportive of the crime bill. They didn't like certain parts of it, but you know, they were they were for it. I mean, they wanted to put more to lock more people away because those this was after the were, LA riots and everything too. Yeah. Yeah, because those people were primarily wreaking havoc on the black yeah. community. Hotep so, Sophia, I mean, she was talking about a similar thing. She's a wonderful guest that we have on regularly. She was talking about how in the black community, a lot of the people who were advocating for locking up uh, people during the crap crack epidemic uh, were a lot of the people who were living in those neighborhoods, a lot of the uh, yeah, community exactly. leaders. So, I mean, there's this mythology that this is like, you know, the, the, this was some white supremacist conspiracy. The new Jim Crow is that yeah. one. Look, the new Jim Crow. So, so, so I, I, want, I, I want to make sure we get to everybody before uh, Ed uh, but Yeah, so I just, do think there yeah. may be some pushback related to that. If we yes. see a serious rise in crime rates, I think that's going to be that's going to lead to a put to a kind of shift away from mm. progressivism and toward more kind of conventionally conservative uh, viewpoints and, you know, and sort of mainstream liberal, really. So, you know, I think that that may be that may end up, uh, you know, significantly slowing down yeah. or reversing in some areas the, uh, you know, the shift toward this radical progressivism. I think so. Let's go to Gio, then let's go to Jess, and then let's go to uh, Alexandra, and then Ed is going to have the final word of the day before we conclude this. If that's all right with you, Ed, I don't know like how much time you have uh, left. I don't want to keep you here. Uh, uh, let's see. Have... Okay, so Gio, go for it, my friend. No, no actually, yeah, I go, I go first. I'll, I'll like, I don't know. I'll... No, well, I, I just I, think I'm, I'm just. Sort well, of, um... well, Ed kind of answered it already as far as what yeah. he anticipates <laughs> in the future. So that's why let's go to Alexandra. Um, what was the question? <laughs> what do you anticipate happening in the future as far as LeBased and Red Pill Gen Z or Gen Alpha or if any of this is going to well, occur? Well, I, I, I have problems well, with the well, Gen Well, Gio, Z being you, were, based, you were actually but... saying, Gio, you were saying earlier that they're a polarized generation, and I believe somebody was saying that they are a, that they are a generation of polar opposites, that there is like both extremes going on within it. And I know like Alexandra, would you agree with that or what are you seeing from your own neck of the woods? Yeah, I I think that's that's probably correct. Um, polarizing implies two poles, but I think we we're gonna have multiple, you know, subsections. You know, hyper reality is really big in in this generation. You know, people kind of developing their own sub communities, and yeah, some of these sub communities will be pretty out there, pretty degenerate, <laughs> if if that's kind of what what uh, that's that's your frame of reference. Uh, and some I think will will be quite trad because that's, you know, the, the backlash, you know, pe- people just looking at millennials caving in. And, you know, the the, you know, Chelsea Handler does not have a great reputation among among yeah. Zoomers, she's not aspirational. Uh, and I think a lot of people will, uh, will, you know, try to I don't know, do some Amish light type things. And, you know, I, I welcome it. I, for one, welcome our new overlords. <laughs> so, uh, I, and I also will be heading to bed because I'll, I'll be moving my, my heavy breathing <laughs> to, to a different room very soon. Yeah. So, uh, and by the way, congratulations, what, congratulations once again on uh, while well, the process is going on right now. What is the new gender yeah. neutral term, by the way, for... Uh, uh, birth m- birthing person that's birthing yeah person. i am a uh a, a birthing pod a mobile birthing <laughs> pod and my baby will be arriving uh imminently so a genderless we'll um little human i think that's the politically correct yeah thing. exactly uh, <laughs> unfortunately lump of lump of cells yes uh, as well. unfortunately we do not get to see the birth in progress on btr that would be very history making but <laughs> oh <my laughs> what are you gonna <laughs> Uh, what are you gonna do live stream yes anyway (laughs) let's let's go to jessica jessica same question what do you anticipate with the next generation of uh of kids as far as uh their uh, various outlooks i think every generation is reacting to the one or two before them actually like yeah if if i'm being totally honest i'm thinking about who's had the greatest influence in my life 
you know, I know growing up, um, since we've talked about activism a lot today, I think about how I learned about what activism was as, you know, until I really learned what it was. And so I'm looking two generations back and I'm seeing all of the, the work, whether you consider it work or not, that went into that time period and, and the challenges they faced and, you know, how that has influenced my generation. Um, so who even really knows what it will look like, but it's always a reaction to things that have happened prior, you know, prior to their arrival. Um, I'm hopeful that whatever it is can get us back to a, a more centered, um, <laughs> what's the right word? I don't want to say normal. I'll just, yeah. I'll just say a more well, centered, reasonable place. Well, you know, another word right. for centered, you could say would be grounded. I mean, would grounded be close? Yeah. And, and you know what else is close to grounded? Based. Be I knew we were going to say that. That, that, I mean, that look, word has become cringe because look, of James Lindsay, so we have to stop it is using it now. totally fine <laughs> by me. All I want is for there to be some recognition. I want people to start acting honestly. I wish people would just admit why they do the things that they do. I, You know, if people want power, say we want power. They're scared. Everybody's scared. Everybody's scared except me and except for break the rules. We are not scared. <laughs> we are going at it. And you are going to see the fruits of our labor pretty soon. So let us go for the final comment to the great Ed West. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate everything that you're doing. And hey. uh, would you offer any light at the end of the tunnel here as far as something that may happen in the future? Uh, the one that I would offer just real quick, I tend to think that, like I said before, what people are seeing with a lot of these people that are just uh, they just have their identity and uh, grievances and nothing else to offer. I don't see them creating anything. And what I would want to see beyond conservative or liberal is I would want to see a movement of people who can create people who can get their consciousness to a higher level, to a higher uh, cycle and I believe that we are all aspects of God. I believe that we are all, let's say, thought forms that are living out as like an aspect of oneness as these individual ego selves. And I also believe that there are cycles within cycles and there are cycles for animals. There are cycles for minerals. There are cycles for humans. And I think that humans can go from one cycle to another and maybe we can reincarnate on a better planet if we're good. Or maybe we'll intentionally reincarnate in a bad planet to test ourselves. But either way, my point is that I think it's all a human test. It's all a test of not even the human, but of co a conscious being to get to a higher level of consciousness. And I think that if we bring out the energy of creating something as opposed to destroying, that that is something that's going to attract a lot of people, regardless of whether they're conservative or liberal or whatever. So that is my piece. That's all I want to say. Follow me on Twitter at LevPo. I'm going to post a Twitter link. But Ed, you have the final say on uh, this whole thing. Oh, I don't know what to say after that. That's so deep. <laughs> I mean, I'm just so mundane. Uh, I... I don't know. I suppose people don't come to me for optimism. I don't think there'll be a that much of a reaction immediately. I mean, I kind of agree that Scott Alexander made this point about, you know, if you're young now, who are the people you want to rebel against who are sort of disapproving? And what in their 60s it would have been your sort of maiden aunt that was anti-sex. And now it's sort of it's the kind of progressive radicals, the ones who are, you know, who are disapproving and tutting and I just don't think, I don't think people aren't that rebellious. I, I think most people will sort of conform. And, and, and I think, you know, Alex was making the point about there's, you know, it's dispersion, basically. Most societies become much more dispersed. Everyone's got their own niche. Everyone's doing their own thing. And um, there'll be little political niches. Most, you know, most people aren't even interested in politics. They won't really care. And we'll just um, go along. I mean, I don't think the kind of like the radical agenda is sustainable in the long term because it's kind of, it's just kind of all fire and fury. It's not a, it's not a, it's and, not and a, furry and furry. It's not a manual, for, <laughs> you know, for, oh God, not again. for a lifestyle. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not like a new religion, which has a kind of, you know, which has a plan, like blueprint for, you know, life, how we all live. It's just a kind of anger. So, I, I mean, I don't really see that, you know, going anywhere in the long term but i think in the i mean i see the young generation my kids at school they're all they're all being indoctrinated pretty hard right now it will take quite a long time to, to, to well to they, they i i think they've got a great father like you to uh show yeah, them, sh show them every night every single night <laughs>
<laughs> All right, guys. Well, this is the end of the stream. I want to thank everybody. Also, to... Oh, yeah. Go, go for it, Gio. Yes. Well, also, I think that we have to bring uh, Kathy on again for yes. like, a, like a post-feminism or a Gamergate stream or some something of that nature. I would love that. If you were interested, Kathy, I would love to do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank here are the Twitter handles Jessica Deloach, Alex Kashuda, Alex Kashuda again, because I forgot that I already posted Alex. And we have Kathy Young over here. Here is oh, Kathy and Young's Ed's Twitter. Book, if you can, yes, uh, I am definitely going to link to Ed's book. I have no yes. idea why the hyperlinks never show up to Amazon.com. This is just one of those things. Of course, follow Geo on Twitter. Here is the link to Geo's Twitter. And of course, follow uh, follow Ed. I'm going to link to your book oh, right now. Oh yeah, a now. new video on my YouTube channel after this comes out. So I'm going to upload a new video. Excellent. Here is the Amazon link to Ed's book. Please buy it. It is a wonderful read. Small message on the wrong side of history see the amazon links they never hyperlink for some reason i don't know why but anyway please get this book it is a wonderful read you are going to love it all of you who are listening and subscribe right now be sure to subscribe right now to break the rules and i'm going to link to geo's youtube channel thursday we are going to have the members of who up pod coming up at a uh, 6 p.m that is happening thursday and sunday is always the uh, art stream which i'm just going to quickly promote right now so first geo i'm going to promote you one second please everybody subscribe patreon you know the deal you know how it goes here okay here is geo's uh, youtube follow geo on youtube check out his latest uh, video there and of course follow me on youtube as well the left stream is coming up on my youtube channel be sure to follow that and lastly but not leastly on thursday our event you are going to see it as soon as the stream is over so be sure not to close this window you're going to see another window pop up so here is the link to the uh linking up with who's up this is happening on thursday so uh, oh and one last thing i just want to say real quick we're going to have tuesday may 18th future governance with uh garrett jones and i don't know if uh, you know garrett uh, ed but he is the uh, yeah, yeah. writer of 10 percent less democracy Oh, yeah, we're in Portrait to London. Oh, nice. Yeah. And also uh, Mark Terrell, who is the founder of Undavos, author of Scaling, Educator and Strategist, and he is a World Economic Forum tech pioneer. So he, so both of them are going to be there, along with Indian Bronson and the Prudentialist. So oh, wow. that's going to be a lot of fun. Anyway, guys. Give me a is, clash. <laughs> yes, this is the end of the stream. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Once again, Thank subscribe. You. you know you Thank want you. to. Take care. Good night, everybody. God bless. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.